there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Over more than 190 kilometers, a stretch of blue cuts through the Egyptian desert. This is the Suez Canal, one of the greatest technical feats of all time. By separating Africa and Asia, this man-made route has transformed the world forever. Since its creation in the 19th century, it allows ships to pass directly from the Mediterranean Ocean through to the Red Sea. This is a considerable shortcut as they no longer have to go around Africa. 18,000 ships take this route each year. They return on one of the busiest waterways in the world. Approximately 700 million tons of merchandise pass through here. These ships have become giants of the sea, weighing up to 240,000 tons and measuring up to 400 meters long. We will explain how the Suez Canal has evolved to meet the needs of the merchant navy. Suez, which is an infrastructure du 19e, must adapt to these flottes totally unimaginable, even for Jules Verne in the 19e siècle. These ships are so large that the canal has become too narrow, stopping the boats from passing one another. In 2014, a giant project is launched. A new 72-kilometer route rises from the sands, effectively creating a two-way navigation system. We in charge of a project colossal, a project pharaonic. In less than a year, 500 million cubic meters of sand are removed from the site. This feat was carried out by an army of bulldozers. And giant dredgers from all around the world. Using never-before-seen 3D images, we will discover how the vacuum cleaners of the sea really work. These machines are at the cutting edge of technology. Because of them, the canal is now 24 meters deep, compared to its original 8 meters. However, the technical means available in the 19th century are very different. Drilling into the isthmus of the Suez thus becomes an extreme challenge. In 1859, when Ferdinand de Lesseps launches this extraordinary project, the region is a complete no-man's land. Everything must be transported to the site, materials, fresh water and a workforce. Suez représente quelque chose de tout à fait euh, euh, exceptionnel euh, qui va marquer une étape fondamentale dans l'histoire des travaux publics. The construction site experiences numerous crises and costs the lives of thousands of men. But under the momentum of the Industrial Revolution, everything changes. We will learn more about the machines that had to be invented in order to complete this astounding task. These machines of the 19th century have allowed to put in place a chantier hors norm and so to build a real mega structure that is still used today. But when surging sands threaten its very existence, the canal must undergo constant maintenance. This proves a real challenge for this one-of-a-kind superstructure. Spanning from the initial works up to the present day, we go behind the scenes of the construction of the Suez Canal. In 2014, a construction site is set up in the middle of the Egyptian desert. This is the building site for the extension of the Suez Canal. The job is clearly immense. They need to dig a second waterway equal in volume to more than 200 large Cheops pyramids. A crazy yet ultimately successful gamble. The new Suez Canal is inaugurated with a great fanfare on the 6th of August 2015. It is an immense source of pride for the Egyptian authorities. Bigger, deeper, cleaner, the canal has been completely transformed. 
these images make their way around the world. Dozens of foreign politicians come to be a part of the occasion. The waterway represents a strategic focus for world maritime trade. The program for the ceremony includes official speeches, a military parade and an aerial display. Pierre Cateau recalls that day. He was the site manager for a dredging company. À cette occasion, nous avons pu voir deux navires se croiser juste devant la tribune officielle pour la première fois dans le canal de Suez. Two ships passing side by side in the Suez Canal constitutes a revolutionary moment in the history of this megastructure. In the past, the waterway was too narrow for two ships to directly pass one another. This forced them to circulate in a different way. Now, thanks to this new 72-kilometer route, a two-way navigation system is possible over this entire stretch. Un petit peu comme si vous aviez une route nationale et vous criez une seconde voie pour créer une autoroute. This second waterway gets rid of the alternate convoy system over a section of the Suez Canal. The transit duration for the ships shifts from 18 hours to 11 hours, and the waiting time is reduced from 11 hours to 3 hours. This is a considerable shortcut, ultimately allowing the maximum traffic capacity on the canal to double in size. By 2030, nearly 100 ships could take this route every day. But in order to reach this goal, an enormous amount of work is required. The construction site is divided into two sections. On one side, the creation of a new 35-kilometer waterway running parallel to the original canal. On the other side, the extension and deepening of the historic waterway over 37 kilometers by the Great Bitter Lake. The Egyptian army works on the first half of the construction site. They tackle enormous amounts of demolition work over an area situated 24 meters above sea level. Their mission, level off the landform to prepare the site for the imminent deepening work for the new canal. An array of bulldozers, scrappers, trucks and skips clear 250 million cubic meters of sand, earth and rocks. The area is then flooded so that the dredgers are able to float. The same quantity of sand still needs to be removed, but this time from under the water. Machines at the forefront of technology, such as the cutter suction dredger, are enlisted for the task. To dig the canal, a different type of machine is used. The cutter suction dredge. With the help of an enormous pipe that reaches to the bottom of the canal, this machine can extract materials all while moving forward. At its head, there is a large suction device. The proportions of these floating giants are huge. They can measure over 200 meters long, the length of two football fields. The technology on board allows the dredgers to remove the material through floating pipes. However, the quantities on this construction site are unprecedented. Thousands of cubic meters of sand run through the pipes and are then poured out several kilometers away in large storage areas in the middle of the Sinai Desert. In 2014, the Suez authorities appeal to two sets of dredging companies. The first is in charge of increasing the depth of the canal to 24 meters. The second must extend the existing waterway, all while respecting the same depth. A particular constraint challenges this section of the work. The task must be completed without interrupting the general navigation. The company for which Pierre Cateau works participated in the dredging of the second zone. Nous étions en charge d'un projet colossal, d'un projet pharaonique, qui comprenait en fait un challenge extrêmement important sur le plan logistique, sur le point de vue organisationnel. The head of the Suez Canal Authority had originally asked for a five-year period to successfully carry out this incredible task. Nevertheless, he would only be given a year in which to do it. The time constraint would constitute a significant challenge for this record-breaking construction site. The next obstacle, the transportation of the materials and the personnel. 
en l'espace de, de quelques mois, un nombre énorme de, de dragues a été mobilisé du, du monde entier. On parle d'environ 40 dragues. En complément de ce matériel principal, un très grand nombre de remorqueurs, de vedettes, de, de conduites, de pontons ont été mobilisés sur le projet. Le, le personnel qui est employé sur ce genre de chantier vient de quatre coins de la planète. Nous avions sur notre chantier 28 nationalités. To afford this extension, the country must spend more than 7 billion euros. The authorities thus rely on a national momentum and appeal for donations. The strategy is successful as 80% of the project would be financed by the Egyptian population all in just a few days. The work on the new Suez Canal is added to a long series of construction sites on the waterway that have been underway since its creation in the 19th century. The construction history of this megastructure dates back more than a century and a half. When the first engineers arrive at the Isthmus of the Suez, they discover a suitable environment for the implementation of a canal, despite its location in a completely isolated region. The Sinai, measuring 60,000 square kilometers, is one of the driest deserts in the world. However, nothing can shake the determination of the canal explorers. The official start of construction to connect the two seas is set for the 25th of April, 1859, but the workers are in for a hellish experience. Thierry Chambol has supervised numerous maritime works throughout his career. As an engineer, he describes the working conditions of the time. He travaille avec de l'eau jusqu'au cuisses, avec un, un petit outil. Il décroche des mottes de terre du fond et il les passe aux voisins. Qui les passe aux voisins, ils font une chaîne et ils vont quand même réaliser 400 000 mètres cubes de déblais grâce à cette technique. Et on sent bien que ça n'est pas une technique qui pourra être prolongée longtemps. The site is in desperate need of a greater workforce. The project is in danger. But where could they find more workers willing to dig the canal? the Egyptian authorities proposed to reinstate the forced labour scheme. Caroline Piquet is a senior lecturer at the Sorbonne. She wrote a reference work on the history of the Suez Canal. La corvée est un système utilisé par les vice-rois en Égypte pour entretenir les, les canaux. Donc plusieurs paysans égyptiens, ce qu'on appelle les félas, sont mis à contribution pour cet entretien. Nearly 400,000 laborers from all over Egypt are forced to dig the canal in extreme conditions. The construction site would cost the lives of thousands of them. The isolation of the site, situated in the desert far from any supplies and equipment, quickly proves to be a problem. Groups of people are forced to deliver everything to the site. Some of the materials, such as wood or large rocks, are entirely missing from the area. Le transport du matériel est une autre grande préoccupation puisqu'il faut faire venir ce matériel d'Europe. Il est ensuite débarqué à Alexandrie, mais ensuite il faut euh, l'acheminer jusque dans l'isthme par chameau et puis par canot. Euh, donc c'est extrêmement long, c'est coûteux. In need of a solution to facilitate the transportation of the materials, the managers of the construction site decide to build a small supply canal. At 50 meters long and 2 meters deep, the supply canal is a reduced scale model of the final canal. The workers first carry out the digging in dry conditions. Once they reach a certain depth, water is poured in so that the dredgers can float while extending and deepening the waterway. The excavated material is used to fill in the banks. Seventy-eight dredgers are built specifically for the Suez Canal construction site. This particular machine is characterized by a central well that allows a bucket chain to descend down to its main body. The lowest bucket strikes the bottom, fills up, and then ascends to pour its contents into the barges. The bucket dredger is at the origin of a series of dredging machines. Like the backhoe dipper excavator, this powerful machine was used on the construction site of the new Suez Canal. Its three enormous stakes are used to stabilize the pontoon so that the excavator can stand on top. 
the shovel digs into the canal bed and unloads the excavated material into a barge moored next to the dredger. It can work on any type of soil. This engine corresponds perfectly with the type of rocks in the region, essentially sand and clay. Since the drilling work for the canal started in 1859, the engineers have been asking themselves how will these soils react when they are put under water. We go to a state-of-the-art laboratory at the École des Ponts Paris Tech. Here we meet Dr. Gabeslou, a specialist in geotechnical engineering. Initially, the project sought to establish an embankment with an incline of 26 degrees. Nevertheless, due to the instability of the soil when placed under water, their original plans would be turned upside down. In the project of the Canal de Suez, the uh, ponts uh, were adoucis naturally in the presence of water. On this reduced scale model of the Suez Canal, the specialist reproduces the same slopes as those originally imagined by the engineers at the time. On crée de plus en plus de zones instables euh, en contact euh, avec de l'eau et la pente va chercher une nouvelle, un nouvel état d'équilibre euh, avec une pente euh, plus douce. Once the canal fills with water, the embankment gradient softens. Some walls even collapse. Consequently, the basin fills with sand. Et c'est ce qu'on observe également ici. On, on est en train de réduire la profondeur euh, du canal. In the 19th century, the engineers decide to let their banks slope naturally. However, this means that they need to dig even deeper in order to reach the appropriate depth. During construction, traffic on the future canal is intense. Convoys of barges towed by men and animals are used to transport the materials. The installation of an additional supply canal quickly begins. Most importantly, this will allow fresh water to be delivered to the construction site. This is a rare product in the desert region, but it is indispensable for such work. Thanks to the canal, water from the Nile is transported to the isthmus from Zagazig to Ismailia, joining onto the Suez thereafter. The fresh water only arrives later to Port Said, first through canalization and then through an extension of the waterway. The fresh water canal follows the trace of a much older waterway. Since the dawn of time, men have been trying to cross the Egyptian desert by boat. Ce percement n'est pas une idée nouvelle, puisque au temps des pharaons, il existait déjà un canal de caractéristiques beaucoup plus limitées qui réunissait le delta du Nil à la mer Rouge. Puis ce canal a été oublié, il n'en restait que des vestiges. For centuries, the world seaborne trade has been using an entirely different route. The solution in connecting Europe and Asia lies in travelling to Egypt to unload the cargo. The transport then continues on land. However, this is not the end. When the groups reach the Red Sea, the goods are loaded onto a second ship for the rest of the trip. A real expedition. A new waterway would only be established by the Portuguese at the end of the 15th century. This new waterway would merge the Oriental borders together, effectively bypassing Africa. This voyage lasts several months. Nearly 300 years later, a French emperor reinstates the idea of drilling into the isthmus of the Suez. Il faut attendre néanmoins l'expédition de, de, de Bonaparte en 1798 pour que le projet véritablement fasse l'objet d'une étude scientifique. Napoleon Bonaparte's engineers conclude that there are too many technical obstacles, so the project ultimately falls into oblivion. In the middle of the 19th century, one French diplomat decides to persevere with this crazy dream. His name is Ferdinand de Lesseps. For Arnaud Ramier de Fortenier, this man would change the face of the world. D'abord, Ferdinand de Lesseps is a personnage énorme, I would say almost monstrous. C'est Jules Verne, c'est Gustave, c'est Eiffel, c'est Lesseps. These are the great travaux du 19e siècle. Et on imagine mal à notre époque. La, le changement d'échelle qu'a représenté l'intervention de ces gens-là. This extraordinary character would ultimately shape the drilling project of the Isthmus of the Suez. In 1854, Ferdinand de Lesseps gets the opportunity of a lifetime when his friend Mohamed Saïd Pasha comes into power. They got to know each other when the French diplomat was working in Egypt. Il persuade Mohamed Saïd Pasha de lui confier la construction du canal. Et c'est là que tout commence. 
Ferdinand de Lesseps gained the exclusive power to dig a canal between the two oceans. They would have the right to exploit it for 99 years. But on his construction site, the work doesn't seem to progress. After two years, the workers don't succeed in removing the required amounts of sand to finish the canal. They lack the necessary machinery. Pour vous donner un ordre de grandeur, le, le canal de Suez au moment de sa création représentait 70 millions de mètres cubes de, de déblais. Hein? 70 millions de mètres cubes qui ont été réalisés en 10 ans. On the construction site for the new canal, it took less than two months to remove the same amount of material. In a century and a half, the quality of the dredges has evolved considerably. The incredible volume of material excavated in the most recent extension project is proof of this. L'élargissement du canal de Suez euh, a représenté 500 millions de mètres cubes, disons 250 millions de mètres cubes par dragage en l'espace de 10 mois. Donc en fait, on retrouve un facteur de plus de 100 entre, disons, la, la, la capacité d'excavation d'aujourd'hui et celle de l'époque. But in order to reach the fixed excavation objectives, the construction site required the mobilization of 75% of the existing dredgers, which amounted to approximately 40 machines from all over the world. Toutes ces dragues, bien entendu, travaillent 24 heures sur 24 et 7 jours sur 7, et de telle façon à effectuer les travaux dans le minimum de temps possible, compte tenu que la contrainte de temps était certainement euh, extrêmement importante sur ce projet. Nowadays, the best dredges are fitted with hydraulic pumps that inject water in order to extract the sediments. Les dragues aspiratrices actuelles sont des engins d'une puissance incroyable et qui peuvent aspirer en une heure 10 000 mètres cubes de sable en place, ce qui aurait nécessité à sec uh, 10 000 ouvriers. In his time, Ferdinand de Lesseps would have loved to work with such effective machines, even if they had only arrived on the Suez Canal after the 1930s. Nowadays, with unimaginable capacities, these machines have facilitated the deepening of the Suez Canal. The key feature of the cutter suction dredge is that it can move and work at the same time. This was an excellent advantage on the construction site of the new Suez Canal, where tasks sometimes had to be carried out without interrupting general navigation. To find out how this machine works, we climb aboard one of these floating giants. This ship works on maintaining the access channel at the port of Antwerp. Dennis Hennebert is its engineer. En fait, la drague elle peut être comparée à un gros aspirateur flottant, un aspirateur des mers, des rivières, et l'élan sera le tuyau d'aspiration. The dredge drag head is the large tube trailing across the length of the hull that links onto the pumping system. Here it measures around 50 meters. Its head resembles that of a giant steel monster. Ça c'est la crépine, la tête de dragage. Donc c'est l'endroit par lequel les matériaux sont aspirés depuis le fond. Donc on a plusieurs éléments, on voit que Cette crépine est équipée de, de genre de dents, donc c'est ce qui permet de, de racler le sol, de faire en sorte que les matériaux sont bien repoussés vers la crépine. Et l'aspiration qui est créée par la pompe est à ce niveau aussi de 10 000 mètres cubeur. Donc euh, cette capacité d'aspiration mélangée avec l'impact des dents qui grattent le sol et également des injections d'eau qui nous permet de mettre en suspension ces matériaux font que nous avons une quantité impressionnante de matériaux qui est directement envoyée vers le puits la drague par la pompe. The filter works with the help of a water injection system. It has a mobile head. This way, it can adapt to fit the incline of the dredging area. The first water injection sets the materials in motion. Then, with assistance from the teeth, a second injection totally decomposes the sediments. The command post for the dredge drag head is located in the control tower. The main technician works with several screens. These allow him to get an overall view of the depth of the zone, the performance of the device, as well as an indication of the amount it has dredged. Be it mud, sand or stones, the collected sediments are all stocked on board, in the centre of the vessel. The largest reservoirs can reach a colossal capacity of up to 45,000 cubic metres, the equivalent to 12 Olympic swimming pools.
Once the well is full, the dredge drag head is pulled up and the ship moves to the excavation area. Nous avons ici un puits d'une capacité de 5000 mètres cubes, un peu plus. Et entre le moment où il est plein et le moment où il est complètement vidé, on a une dizaine de minutes. The shutters situated at the bottom of the hold help to unload the excavated material into the clearing zone. This technique is known as piling. Et les jets que vous voyez, c'est de l'eau qu'on repompe, de l'eau propre qui nous permet de rincer le puits qui permet de s'assurer que tous les sédiments sont bien évacués à l'endroit approprié. An alternative clearing system consists in forcing the material through a pipe. The excavated material can then be transported several kilometers away through the means of either a floating or underground piping system. These two methods were used on the new Suez Canal construction site. A large piling zone was set up to the west of the Great Bitter Lake. The materials were removed via the piping system and unloaded into large hollow areas in the heart of the Sinai Desert. The final method employed for removing dredged materials is known as rainbowing. This is normally used for beach nourishment. In the 19th century, the excavation of rubble from what will be the future canal is a big problem. In 1864, before the influx of machines, the construction site confronts a serious crisis. The forced labor scheme, authorizing the use of Egyptian peasants for the work, is abolished. At this time, the Industrial Revolution in Europe is in full swing. The engineers thus try to invent new machines to keep the construction site going. Lavalley Industries develop long gangways to unload the excavated material directly from the dredgers. This had never been done before. The dredger scoops mud up from the bottom of the water in what will be the future canal. It then unloads the excavated material into a gutter that can measure up to 70 meters long. A pump sends jets of water to dissolve the extracted matter and pushes it towards the exit. A horizontal hinge, situated at the junction of the dredger, helps to modify the incline of the gangway. A metallic trellis that rests on an iron barge assures the machine's stability. This innovation changes the construction site for good. The canal progresses at an astounding speed, but in the areas where the banks are more highly elevated, the dredger with the long gangway is destabilized. Several accidents are accounted for. An alternative machine is developed. This engine, known as the lift, permits the excavation of the materials directly from the barge. We have a meeting with Lionel Dufault. He is the collections manager at the Museum of Arts and Trades. Le dénominateur à toutes ces machines, c'est l'emploi de la machine à vapeur. La machine à vapeur, on la connaît depuis la fin du XVIIIe siècle. Elle était plutôt destinée au départ à, à l'exor, c'est-à-dire au pompage des eaux d'infiltration dans les mines. Et à la fin du XVIIIe siècle, on va modifier la machine à vapeur pour euh, en faire finalement une machine qui fournisse de la force motrice pour animer d'autres machines. Consequently, the steam engine shifts to the railway, in locomotives, and onto water, on board ships. It is also used in workshops or construction sites for public works, as a means to support the other machines. The locomobile is donc a machine à vapeur, mobile. Uh, on la déplace et on l'installe là où on en a besoin. Uh, elle comprend une chaudière, hein, qu'on qu voit ici, qu'on devine dans, dans le corps principal. Une chaudière qu'on alimente avec du combustible, généralement uh, du charbon ou de la houille. Et cette machine à vapeur va permettre de fournir une force sous pression euh, qui va être euh, utilisée pour faire bouger ce volant auquel on va relier une courroie qui elle-même va animer d'autres machines. Sur le chantier de Suez, les locomobiles étaient utilisées pour animer des grues ou des pompes, par exemple. The locomobiles are also used to operate pumps for the long gangways. The dredgers, on the other hand, use their own steam engine. In Europe, a real enthusiasm is generated around the technical revolutions established on the construction site. Le canal de Suez a été présenté à l'exposition universelle de Paris en 1867. Il fait l'objet d'une véritable fierté euh, parmi les ingénieurs français, parmi les diplomates, euh, parmi aussi les, les armateurs, les chambres de commerce. 
the Suez Canal Company holds several conferences in front of a giant model of the project that is exhibited during the event. Along with this technical revolution, a series of innovations in all domains soon follows. Notably in Port Said, the engineers face a typically insurmountable problem. There aren't enough stone quarries in the region to build the harbour jetties. One entrepreneur suggests that they build artificial blocks with a base made of sand and lime. 30,000 blocks are made. Another building site develops within the Suez Canal construction site. Alors l'entreprise du zoo va réaliser un chantier extraordinaire de construction des blocs, des blocs de 20 tonnes et va créer une véritable usine de fabrication des blocs, il y en a des milliers et des milliers qui vont sécher pendant environ un mois et qu'on va ensuite conduire en mer en les chargeant avec une énorme grue sur des chalons, on les amène à l'emplacement voulu pour constituer la digue. This would be the first manufacturing site for artificial blocks in history. The fabrication of the blocks would still require years of further development, and the blocks used for the jetties would need to be replaced on a regular basis. Another section of the construction site is deemed problematic for the work required in the elevated areas of the site. L'évacuation des déblés du fond de la fouille jusqu'au relief naturel pose un problème difficile. D'abord, il faut un effort considérable pour tirer les wagons sur la ligne de plus grande pente. Ensuite, le raccordement au niveau du relief naturel est évidemment difficile, il y a une sorte de cassure. A ramp system is established along the length of the slope. At the bottom of the cavity, the workers dig the future canal. The excavated materials are loaded into small carts and connected to a railway track. Towed by steam winches, they ascend the slope in order to reach the disposal site. Another challenge for both the past construction site and the latest one is the difficult management of the rocky banks. To solve this problem, there is a machine that has been specially adapted to work on this type of land. It is known as the cutter suction dredger. This giant of the sea can measure up to 150 meters long and 30 meters wide. The dredger gets into position and fixes itself into the ground by using its large stakes. It then moves around this axis with the help of its lateral winches linked to giant anchors. The cutter head is at the front of the vessel. This enormous drill can reach up to three meters in diameter. Its mission, destroy the rocks, even the hardest one, under the water and on the banks. This giant engine is controlled from a steering cabin equipped with the latest technology. Dredgers, such as the IBN Batuta, are capable of positioning themselves with incredible precision in order to carry out their demolition work. The amount of rubble produced is truly phenomenal. Rocks, sand, mud, clay, all of the materials are sucked up through hydraulic pumps and then pushed back into the floating pipes and tubes laid out on the shore. When it is possible to unload the excavated material into an underwater zone, the pipe connected to the cutter head is tied to a raft equipped with a continuous spreading system. As an alternative option, the excavated materials are unloaded onto barges that are moored to the dredger. Once they reach the disposal site, the hull splits in two in order to get rid of the cargo. In total, 25 cutter suction dredgers were utilized on the construction site for the new Suez Canal. This had never been seen before. One of the first drags that we have mobilized on this project is a drag d'Artagnan, which is a pavillon français. It has been mobilized since a chantier that was passed in Russia, the peninsula of Yamal. With a horsepower of 38,000, it is one of the most powerful dredgers in the world. During the 19th century, the workers also face several rocky obstacles while developing the future canal. Destroying the rocks requires Herculean strength. A new machine thus piques the interest of the Suez Company to help them overcome this difficult area. Et donc on va utiliser l'excavateur de couvreux qui est une machine capable d'extraire la roche à sec dans des zones qui n'ont pas encore été inondées. 
Nicknamed the steam shovel, nearly 16 couvreaux excavators are built especially for the Suez construction site. The excavator moves on rails positioned along the future canal and gradually widens it. In the space of three years, it assists in the removal of 9 million cubic meters of land, a record. Its specially formed buckets allow it to extract a significant amount of rock before ascending back up to the excavator. The extracted matter is taken away in small carts. Once they are all loaded, a locomotive takes them to the disposal site. Little by little, the railway line becomes a normal part of the construction site. It helps not only with the transportation of the material, but with the transportation of the staff as well. These temporary railway lines are constructed and deconstructed as is necessary for excavation. But even the Couvreau excavator does not always succeed in destroying the rocks. In 1869, two months before the inauguration of the Suez Canal, rocky banks are discovered in the waterway at a depth of four meters, when in reality the canal should be eight meters deep. So there is a pressure on the engineers and on the workers that is extraordinary. Et ce dérocktage euh, sous-marin, on ne sait pas très bien faire. Donc on va immerger des bouteilles de 4 à 5 litres de poudre réunies par un tuyau en caoutchouc qui contient le cordon qu'on va allumer à la surface pour faire éclater ces bouteilles à la surface du banc rocheux. The aim is to create a sufficient passageway for the ships of the time in terms of the submerged portion of the vessel. This is what is known as the draft. The passage is completed in the final weeks of the construction site. Le Péluse, qui est le bateau de la compagnie des messageries impériales, fait 5 mètres de tirant d'eau. Il passe juste. Certains bateaux talonnent le jour de l'inauguration. Pour d'autres, on a déplacé la charge du bateau de l'arrière vers l'avant pour que leur tirant d'eau à l'arrière soit un peu moins fort. Mais on se rend compte de la pression extraordinaire qui existe. Alors on donne des primes aux ouvriers, on fort de nuit. Enfin, c'est un chantier incroyable qui se met en place pour arriver au résultat recherché. After 10 years of labor, the Suez Canal finally becomes a reality. The Red Sea and the Mediterranean Ocean join together. The waterway measures 164 kilometers in total. The route now joins the main cities of the Isthmus together, Port Said on the Mediterranean Ocean, Ismailia in the middle, and finally Suez at the mouth of the Gulf by the Red Sea. On the 17th of November 1869, the Suez Canal is inaugurated. It is an international event. Ferdinand de Lesseps has made the Pharaoh's dream a reality. Open to all nations, the Suez Canal changes the world's seaborne trade forever. From this point onwards, the journey between Europe and the Indies is cut in half. To get from Marseille to Bombay, the original distance around Africa was more than 19,000 kilometers. With the Suez Canal, it amounts to almost 8,000 kilometers. This is a considerable shortcut. Originally, two to three months of navigation via the Cape of Good Hope would have been the norm when traveling between these two ports. By passing through the Isthmus, the journey is reduced to a single month. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Suez Canal Company acquires an industrial site, the general workshops situated in Port Fouad. The naval construction site is thus at the height of technology. The workshops fabricate the company equipment. More than a thousand individuals work there. Nevertheless, during its first years of operation, the canal maintenance service faces an unexpected hitch. The backflow created by the passing of the ships damages the embankments. Alors, plusieurs méthodes sont utilisées, des méthodes de pérée, d'enrochement. On utilise notamment euh, des, des roches, des carrières d'Ataka à proximité de, de Suez. On utilise des revêtements maçonnés. Les résultats ne sont jamais très satisfaisants. Les, les berges s'effondrent régulièrement et la compagnie doit faire appel à des études plus scientifiques d'experts euh, de laboratoires hydrauliques en France. Situated close to Grenoble, this hydraulic laboratory is still operating today. Luc Am is the maritime technical director. Here they study all sorts of water-related developments on smaller scale models. 
When the Suez Canal Company contacts them in the middle of the 20th century, the waterway is in bad shape. Environ 120 km de berge étaient dégradées sérieusement et à l'époque, les estimations au début des années 50 étaient d'environ d'un milliard de francs par an de coûts de réparation de ces dégradations. The laboratory recreates a section of the Suez Canal. A smaller scale model of the vessel is first towed through and later self-propelled. Il faut imaginer que ces bateaux remplissaient les deux tiers du canal pour les plus gros. Et donc, il n'y avait plus beaucoup d'eau. Et donc, il y avait une résistance à l'avancement. Les navires n'arrivaient pas à obtenir la bonne vitesse. Ça créait des, des courants extrêmement forts de plusieurs mètres par seconde. The studies focus on trying to understand this resistance so as to modify the shape of the hulls in the ships. The research proves so innovative that it quickly captures the attention of various oil companies. The models improve. The final result, the ships move with greater ease through the water and the traffic of the canal is optimized. In spite of all these efforts to maintain the waterway, further extension work quickly becomes inevitable. The Suez Canal must continuously adapt to the ever-evolving shapes of new ships. We find out more at the National Navy Museum. La taille des navires explose après la, la Deuxième Guerre mondiale dans une, une course au gigantisme qui, que pour l'instant, rien n'a arrêté. On construit à une taille qu'on pense raisonnable par rapport à un état de la flotte, mais on est déjà en retard par rapport à, aux structures, aux bateaux qui sont en train de construits. Évidemment, Suez, qui est une infrastructure du 19e, à la fois est une méga structure, mais qui, a dû, qui doit s'adapter à ces flottes totalement inimaginables, même pour Jules Verne au 19e siècle. In 1950, 40,000 ton ships are outdated. Their proportions are nothing in comparison to the other vessels of the time, such as the Pelouse. With its 2,000 tons, the ship owned by the Imperial Maritime Shipping Company is one of the first to have travelled on the Suez Canal. The waterway also has to make it through the 20th century with all of its conflict. On the 26th of July, 1956, Colonel Nasser gives a momentous speech in front of a crowd of Egyptians. He announces the nationalization of the Suez Canal. The Western powers react to this. The United Kingdom, France and Israel launch a military operation that ultimately ends in failure. However, navigation on the canal is stopped for almost five months. The canal deteriorates. With the help of the UN, Egypt repairs and modernizes the canal. With its depth increased to 14 meters, the waterway can now handle ships with an 11 meter draft. In 1967, a new crisis shakes the region, the Six Day War. Along with other Arab countries, Egypt battles against Israel. The Suez Canal turns into a war zone. Sunken ships and mines obstruct the navigation. The basin fills with sand and the embankments collapse. The waterway is closed down. La fermeture du canal de Suez après la guerre des six jours est une véritable catastrophe puisque le canal de Suez euh, ne sera pas entretenu pendant huit années et lorsqu'il est réouvert en 1975, il n'est plus adapté euh, à la marine pétrolière. Avant la guerre, il accueillait à peu près 80% de cette marine marchande. Après la guerre, on tombe à un tiers. Donc c'est une perte de clients énorme. La plupart des armateurs ont repris le chemin du contournement de, 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 de l'Afrique et de manière à rentabiliser les parcours, ont construit des, des, des bateaux qui dépassent les 200 000 tonnes. Donc ils ne sont absolument plus adaptés au, au canal de Suez. The Egyptian authorities must act. So, with the help of the international community, they launch a rehabilitation and modernization program for the canal. Thereafter, the canal doubles in size at four separate points to allow the ships to pass one another. Port Said and Cabret, both of which have been part of the site since 1955, join onto the Bala bypass. Ultimately, a new bypass at the Great Bitter Lake spans over a five-kilometer distance. Similarly to motorway junctions, these bypasses allow the ships to travel in both directions. Thanks to these new dimensions, the canal can withstand ships weighing up to 150,000 tons. These ships have turned into giants of the sea that need to be controlled. 
At Port Revel Ship Handling Centre in Isère, pilots and captains learn how to manoeuvre the ships with the help of small-scale models. These mini-liners, container ships, ferries and tankers, all about a dozen metres long, can hold up to two people. On this five-hectare lake, all sorts of maritime infrastructures have been recreated, including a section of the Suez Canal. Jean-Paul Jean-Jean is an instructor. This morning, he is training two interns to attempt the bypass on the Suez Canal. This manoeuvre is normally forbidden. Here, potential errors can be pushed beyond the security limits. It is a good way to test the ship's reactions. Sur les canaux en général, quand il n'y a pas suffisamment de place ou quand les bateaux s'approchent trop près l'un de l'autre, ils prennent un risque. Il y a des forces qui se développent et qui font que les bateaux sont ou attirés ou repoussés. Et si c'est dans un canal, c'est plus étroit, ça peut donner des embardés, enfin des, des changements de direction involontaires que le capitaine ou le pilote ne peuvent pas prévoir et donc c'est dangereux. Les deux bateaux sont parallèles, les deux arrières sont proches, très proches. Et là, le risque, c'est que le, le Grenoble va s'échouer. This is a tenfold hazard as maritime infrastructures are often overcrowded. But how can you maneuver ships that are continuously increasing in speed and size yet lack in power? Alors, les problèmes classiques des, des gros navires dans les canaux, dû à l'inertie des navires, ben, ils sont de plus en plus difficiles à manœuvrer. Et ça veut dire qu'il faut anticiper toutes leurs réactions. Et pour anticiper leurs réactions, il faut les connaître et connaître les réactions du profil du canal, par exemple, ou des ports. Dans Dans lesquels ils se rendent. Captains and pilots are now learning how to maneuver giant ships on the Suez Canal that can weigh up to 240,000 tons. After the development of the two-way navigation system, the draft limit is increased to more than 20 meters. The canal is even at the origin of the measurement unit, known as the Suez Max. This unit determines the maximum dimensions possible for a ship to be able to pass through the megastructure. This is a constraint for certain ship owners. Eric Banel is their representative in France. It is very difficult to imagine a navy that does not cross the Canal de Suez. And the maximum size of navires for the Canal de Suez is the maximum maximum for a large part of the maritime fleet. And that's why we call these navires the Suez Max. One of the main objectives of the extension work was to adapt the waterway to match the new dimensions of the merchant navy. However, this risks the disqualification of the canal. Even now, it is still one of the most used waterways in the world. Aujourd'hui, nous avons à peu près une cinquantaine de navires par jour sur le canal de Suez. L'objectif affiché avec le doublement du canal par les autorités égyptiennes est une centaine de navires. The Suez Canal constitutes a strategic passageway for maritime carriers. The waterway drains out almost 8% of global traffic. It also represents an enormous economic stake for the Egyptian authorities. Aujourd'hui, ce coût de passage du canal représente à peu près 800 000 dollars pour un porte-conteneur de 18 000 conteneurs. Cette source de revenus, aujourd'hui, on l'estime donc à plusieurs centaines de millions pour l'État égyptien, c'est la troisième source de revenus du budget égyptien aujourd'hui. Egypt thus has every interest to keep investing in its megastructure. Back at the Suez Canal, we climb on board a container ship. Max is the captain. We are at the moment uh, proceeding uh, northbound in the Suez Canal. Here, the navigation laws are strict. Direction and speed must be constantly controlled in order to avoid crashing into another ship. Yeah, it's going uh, smooth, no problems here. Okay. A pilot from the Suez Canal Authority advises the captain on which maneuvers to pursue. This is a compulsory measure. It's quite important to navigate correctly here in the canal because, as you can see, there's not much room on uh, each side of the vessel. This is no ordinary day for the captain and his crew. This is the first time they are passing through the new Suez Canal. I've been here approximately 40 times, but uh, today is special that we will be turning to starboard into the new canal instead of 
turning the port into the old one. It is a special moment in the captain's career. Yeah, of course, it's uh, special uh, every time when you do something first time, and uh, it will also be special now to when we get to, to the approach to the new new channel. Little by little, the landscape changes. Now it's quite amazing how much uh, sand they really have uh, digged out of, of this canal. We have mountains both sides now. And it's incredible. The Suez Canal, the gem of the industrial world, continues to blow us away with its innovations. Now, as a two-way navigation system, the megastructure must overcome another challenge, namely how to cross it. The new Suez Canal has rendered certain infrastructures obsolete, such as the El Ferdan railway bridge. At 340 metres, it was the longest swing bridge in the world. Now it no longer serves any purpose. To cross over the dual waterway and make the Sinai region more accessible, several infrastructures will take shape. A notable addition to the programme, the construction of two motorway tunnels beneath the Suez Canal near Port Said. This is an entirely new challenge as it involves drilling a double tube measuring nearly four kilometres long. A subsequent railway tunnel may even accompany this technical feat. Constantly changing in size, depth and modernity, the Suez Canal is in a state of perpetual transformation. The second most visited cathedral in France, a uniquely shaped, true masterpiece of religious architecture, the Cathedral of Strasbourg, France. Vous la dessinez en trois traits, vous reconnaissez la cathédrale de Strasbourg. Revolutionary, both aesthetically and architecturally, a masterpiece of Gothic architecture and a mad gamble for the Middle Age builders, building the tallest monument of all Christianity. Il y a cette course à la hauteur uh, entre Bâle, Vienne, Cologne, Strasbourg pour avoir le, le, le bâtiment le plus haut. After years of research, experts have been able to retrace in three dimensions the incredible history of this project, which took four centuries to complete. But how did the builders of the era defy the laws of physics to build higher and higher? Grâce à la voûte d'ogive et à l'invention de l'arc boutant, ces deux éléments combinés permettent de libérer complètement l'espace. And how did they attain this architectural precision without weakening the structure? Quand vous avez des, des pierres posées les unes à côté des autres, vous mettez des agrafes, comme une agrafeuse, des agrafes en fer. Il y a des tonnes et des tonnes de métal dans la cathédrale. The spire of this cathedral, which will come to dominate Europe until the 19th century, sparks the enthusiasm of researchers. On n'a pas un escalier, on n'en a pas deux, on en a huit. Géométriquement, mais c'est incroyable, c'est une folie. It continues to raise numerous questions. Je n'arrive même pas encore à, à imaginer comment on a pu oser quelque chose, quelque chose comme ça. And why does this otherwise perfectly symmetric cathedral have just one spire? On a des dessins d'une deuxième tour. On sait même qu'elle avait été commencée. Tout d'un coup, le chantier s'est arrêté. On ne sait pas exactement pourquoi. Welcome to the Cathedral of Strasbourg, an exceptional project that took 400 years and enlisted the best architects of the Middle Ages. A masterpiece of Gothic architecture, Strasbourg Cathedral is a one-of-a-kind monument. Topped by its unique spire and adorned with a pink sandstone exterior, this cathedral has become the symbol not only of the city, but also the entire region. Located on the border with Germany, the cathedral stands tall in the city centre, situated in one of the most historic neighbourhoods of the Alsatian capital of Strasbourg. Quand vous arrivez à Strasbourg, vous voyez la flèche de la cathédrale de Strasbourg émerger de la ville, c'est tout à fait spectaculaire. Et 
quand vous rentrez dans la ville, vous ne voyez plus la cathédrale. Et elle réapparaît de façon extrêmement violente au moment où vous arrivez sur la place. Et à ce moment-là, vous voyez cette dentelle de pierre qui s'impose à vous. Et je crois que c'est là toute la magie de cette cathédrale. Its scale is spectacular. 118 meters in length and 51 meters wide. It's the size of a football field. A true skyscraper of the Middle Ages, this monument reaches 142 meters high, the equivalent of a tower 40 stories tall. This cathedral would remain the tallest building in the Christian world until the 19th century. The interior is just as impressive. The cathedral's vaults, which rise over 32 meters tall, reveal the genius of their builders. But how were they able to build such a marvel? The history of this groundbreaking project begins in the 12th century, a time when architecture was in the midst of an evolution. The techniques being adopted allowed architects to slowly shift from the Romanesque style to the Gothic style. Le style gothique, ça veut dire tout d'un coup, on veut construire plus haut, avec des murs plus minces, avec des grandes ouvertures qui ramènent beaucoup de lumière. Je pense pour un visiteur au Moyen-Âge, au XIIIe siècle, d'arriver dans cette nef complètement lumineuse a dû être un choc. To allow light into this revolutionary cathedral, the architects applied the new principles of Gothic architecture. It is a question of raising the arches as high as possible and making the openings in the walls as large as possible, a real challenge for the builders. To accomplish this, the weight of the building is directed to pillars supported at the exterior by flying buttresses and buttress walls. A real technological feat. Today, experts are trying to understand the construction techniques that were used in the Middle Ages to achieve such a feat. But the archives that would allow us to retrace the history of this project are lacking. It's a work of detective and almost a work of the archaeologist of the building, because I would say that we do a zoom forward to understand the monument and decelate all the indices. In the 19th century, restoration work on the foundations of the cathedral would reveal some crucial information. Lors de ces fouilles, on découvre que les fondations de la cathédrale reposent sur une ancienne cathédrale, en tout cas un ancien bâtiment. In addition, the experts have found evidence of the existence of an original cathedral. This text indicates that the first stone was placed in 1015 under the leadership of the bishop of the period, a certain Werner. Another item supports the existence of this older structure. This window, composed of two stained glass panels superimposed on one another. Preuve a été faite que ces personnages superposés correspondent à des fenêtres de dimension inférieure, voire de la moitié de celle d'aujourd'hui, et donc ça nous fournit des dimensions relativement précises des fenêtres de cette basilique de Werner, euh, qui était un, un édifice d'une conception très différente de la cathédrale actuelle. The original basilica had very small openings and was very different from the cathedral of today. Despite this discovery, numerous mysteries remain as to the development of the structure. Stéphane Potier has devoted seven years of his life to studying the history of this monument. C'est une véritable bibliothèque d'architecture en fait. La durée de construction, c'est à peu près quatre siècles. Donc en fait, on a quasiment tous les styles d'architecture qui se développe au fur et à mesure dans, dans cet édifice. Thanks to the exceptional work of this architect, the missing former cathedral has now been recreated in 3D. With its thick walls and small windows, the original basilica was typical of the Romanesque architectural style, a rustic architecture that matches the technology and building techniques of the beginning of the Middle Ages, between the 10th and 12th century. But how did this original structure become the cathedral that we all know today? And above all, why was it transformed? The archives give us the beginnings of an answer. 
dans l'histoire, c'est juste écrit « la cathédrale a brûlé ». Est-ce que c'est un petit feu Est-ce que c'est un grand incendie qui a détruit une grande partie de la cathédrale On ne sait pas. Mais on a connaissance de, plus, de plusieurs euh, incendies. The Romanesque cathedral is perhaps seriously damaged. In any case, it is decided to rebuild the building. The project begins around 1180, and the first choice the builders make is to keep the existing foundations. Ils ont tout simplement profité de cette opportunité pour gagner du temps aussi, puisque voilà, il suffit pour eux de suivre ces fondations, et c'est toujours ça de gagner. These foundations are indeed colossal. Wooden piles were first driven into the underlying rock. To stabilize the whole thing, a layer of clay two meters thick was laid down. Finally, very thick foundation blocks were laid down. It is on these walls that today's cathedral rests. Et donc, du coup, vous avez la seule cathédrale gothique actuelle sur un plan du 11e siècle. C'est le même plan de cathédrale du 11e siècle et aujourd'hui. Like almost all religious buildings, the layout of Strasbourg Cathedral forms a Latin cross with an east-west axis. On one side rises the choir, reserved for the clergy. Then comes the transept at the level of the arms of the cross. At the crossing of the transept and in the apse is the altar from which mass is celebrated. And then comes the nave, reserved for the faithful. While the cathedral follows the original cross layout, it is higher than the original cathedral, and above all, in a radically different style. Why did the builders of the time choose to rebuild identically to the former cathedral? It is very frequent that the cathedrals were constructed sur the temps long, and the temps long impose the evolution of the style parce que à chaque époque euh, on veut construire dans une forme de modernité euh, qui se retrouve dans le style de la construction. In the 12th century, the city of Strasbourg was not part of the Kingdom of France, but belonged instead to the Holy Roman Empire. And in the empire, the architecture in force was Romanesque, characterized by thick walls and small openings. The reconstruction of the cathedral began around 1180. The builders began on the north side of the transept. But at the same time, in France, Gothic architecture was in fashion, with its higher and more open buildings. This style will dominate in the construction of the Cathedral of Strasbourg. À partir du moment où le roman a commencé à céder la place au gothique, L'évêque de Strasbourg de l'époque a commencé à faire subir des transformations à l'édifice roman et à vouloir introduire le style gothique lui aussi dans sa cathédrale romane. The bishop called upon the best architects of his time. They come from France, where they had worked on some of the most prestigious construction projects, such as the cathedrals of Paris and Chartres. Il faut bien comprendre que les architectes qui étaient appelés à Strasbourg, c'était les stars de l'époque. Les architectes étaient itinérants, ils voyageaient, ils étaient curieux, ils connaissaient, ils étaient dans des réseaux hein, de maîtres d'œuvre, donc on partageait les connaissances, on volait le savoir de son concurrent. These ingenious builders master the most advanced construction techniques, such as the rib vault. In the new cathedrals, the rib vault replaces the barrel vault, which was the only one known since antiquity. It is a real technical revolution. With its semicircular shape, the rib vault exerts very strong force horizontally. Because of this force, the pillars had to be very thick in order to resist it. By transforming the semicircle into a pointed arch, the rib vault allows a new distribution of weight. This permits the pillars to be thinner and higher. Quand vous arrivez sur de l'architecture gothique, les voûtes d'ogives, c'est des euh, nervures qui sont montées euh, en arc brisé. Et les arcs brisés, contrairement à, à un demi-cercle, si vous brisez, du coup, la descente des charges de la voûte se concentre sur des points verticaux. 
When the Gothic architects arrived on the building site at the beginning of the 13th century, progress on Strasbourg Cathedral was already well advanced. Arrive le maître d'œuvre gothique, qui lui arrive avec un transept nord roman, un chœur roman, une abside romane et un transept sud qui est monté à moitié. Et il se retrouve avec cette problématique, comment on arrive à faire passer l'architecture gothique dans cet espace roman. For the master builder, the challenge is to make the transition between two radically different architectural principles. To the north of the already built transept, the pillars are massive, following the rules of Romanesque construction. But as you look south, the appearance changes with the pillar of angels, much more delicate and typical of the Gothic style. This pillar is a true artistic and technological achievement. L'architecte du Pays des Anges, qui vient probablement d'Ile de France, réalise euh, des voûtes d'ogives parfaites dans le transept sud, supportées par le Pilier des Anges. Et le Pilier des Anges, c'est un chef-d'œuvre en termes de sculpture, sachant qu'à l'époque, l'architecte est très souvent aussi sculpteur. Et en plus, chaque statue fait partie de la colonne et, est, et elle aussi euh, porte le, le poids des voûtes sur ce pilier. It is the tour de force of the Gothic style, knowing how to transform structural elements into decorative ones. If you look carefully at the pillars, you can clearly see the break in architectural style. On voit très bien que des portails, que ça s'arrête net. On a une espèce d'énorme support euh, comme ça, sur lequel il vient poser euh, celui-là, ce petit support. Alors on a bien les traces où on passe du roman au gothique. Within just a few meters, the building changes its appearance. But why did the architect keep the Romanesque elements? Pourquoi à ce moment-là, quand on change d'architecte, on ne démolit pas ce qui a été fait pour avoir une cohérence architecturale qu'on peut retrouver par exemple à Notre-Dame de Paris C'est parce qu'il y avait une règle non écrite. C'était que quand un architecte décédé ou son successeur n'avait pas le droit de toucher au travail de son prédécesseur. As a result, the north transept has massive pillars, typical of the Romanesque style, while in the south, these columns have an incredible finesse. Thanks to this innovation, the architectural project takes on an unprecedented scale. The Louvre Notre Dame Foundation was created to finance this project, which would become colossal. À l'époque, toute la ville participe à la construction de la cathédrale. C'est les dons, les donations, les legs des Strasbourgeois qui permettent la construction de la cathédrale de Strasbourg. These donations make it possible to set up an extraordinary building site. His organization challenges the preconceived ideas about the Middle Ages. Alors les légendes de 300 400 artisans avec un bonhomme qui tombe toutes les 5 minutes de l'échafaudage ça c'est vraiment des légendes. C'était des équipes beaucoup plus petites sur les cahiers euh, qui référencent en fait les ouvriers, euh, on n'a jamais plus de 50 personnes sur le chantier. The first stage of the construction site is in the quarry. There the workers extract sandstone, the local material used to build the whole building. The next task is to transport the sandstone to the cathedral. A daunting task, as the largest blocks of stone can weigh up to a ton. Ces éléments arrivent sur des chars, hein, tirés par des bœufs. Donc, imaginez le travail, la traction. Les routes sont pas bitumées, donc c'est un travail colossal. Ils arrivent au pied de la cathédrale. A stone cutting workshop is set up on the site. It will allow the craftsmen to work all year round, regardless of the weather conditions. Les tailleurs de pierre vont euh, tailler, préparer les blocs pendant l'hiver dans un atelier couvert, chauffé, et ils vont poser toutes ces pierres qu'ils ont préparées pendant l'hiver en été sur le chantier. Ça, c'est la nouveauté avec cette installation d'un atelier fixe à Strasbourg au XIIIe siècle. Alongside the stonemasons, blacksmiths make the tools. Masons build the walls. Carpenters build and install the scaffolding. 
an entire stewardship is put in place. C'est une organisation professionnelle très très organisée. Chacun sa place, chacun son travail. On commence à, à organiser les choses de façon très rationnelle. Et euh, c'est les prémices en fait de, de la société comme elle est aujourd'hui. Around 12:35, work began on the nave. The architect wanted to achieve the impossible, to raise the walls higher and higher, to let the light in, and to extend the space inside the cathedral. On relève en permanence des défis pour monter les voûtes plus haut, pour faire des fenêtres plus grandes, permettant de réduire la matière au maximum de ce qu'il est possible de faire avec de la pierre de taille. Once again, the rib vault will enable them to meet this challenge. This construction technique directs the weight of the vault to the pillars. This way, the walls are not load-bearing and can accommodate large openings without the risk of weakening the building. On the outside of the building, the builders will place a pointed arch combined with a buttress to direct the horizontal force towards the ground. The principle of l'arboutant is tout simplement une échelle qu'on appuie contre un mur qui vient pousser vers vers la façade et donc qui vient équilibrer simplement les charges entre la poussée de la voûte d'ogive et l'arc-boutant. Les arcs-boutants, en fait, ont permis euh, de monter les murs beaucoup plus haut et d'alléger la structure pour laisser passer la lumière. Thanks to this complex system, the builders achieved a tremendous feat. No more thick walls and small Romanesque style openings. The genius of the architects of this Gothic period was also their success in combining practicality with aesthetics, as evidenced by the 12 buttresses on either side of the nave. They also have another function. They cleverly conceal a complex system of gutters. Throughout this network, gargoyles allow rainwater to be drained off. But the placement of these pointed arches has another use, this time inside the cathedral. Les arcs-boutants qu'on trouve très beaux à l'extérieur, ils sont faits pour dégager de l'espace intérieur et permettre de reporter plus loin euh, la, euh, la poussée des voûtes pour dégager l'espace intérieur. As a result, the dimensions of the nave are impressive, 36 meters wide and 40 meters long. The vaults are 32 meters high, the equivalent of a 10-story building. Grâce à la voûte d'ogive et à l'invention de l'arc boutant, ces deux éléments combinés permettent de libérer complètement l'espace des parois latérales. With the Gothic style, the walls disappear in favor of large openings. Consequently, Strasbourg Cathedral has 1,500 square meters of stained glass windows. Dans la cathédrale, quand vous regardez la nef, il n'y a que des vitraux. Il y, a, il y a la structure en pierre, mais elle est, elle est vraiment minimalisée. Elle est juste là pour tenir, euh, pour euh, être la structure du bâtiment. In order to extend this extraordinary building up to dizzying heights, the builders have to redouble their ingenuity. One material will enable them to make their wildest dreams come true, iron. Si vous regardez bien les, les cathédrales, c'est du métal habillé en pierre. Il y a des tonnes et des tonnes de métal dans la cathédrale. In Strasbourg Cathedral, iron is omnipresent. This almost invisible skeleton is essential to the building structure. In these pillars, for example, the builders stapled the stone blocks together and then cast lead to secure them. Quand vous avez des, des pierres posées les unes à côté des autres, vous mettez des agrafes, comme une agrafeuse, des agrafes en fer, qui viennent, elles, solidariser les pierres les unes avec les autres. This ensures that the components are firmly attached to each other, 
This innovation, which makes it possible to go bigger and higher, is known as chainage. On sait que la construction gothique était intrinsèquement lié au principe de chaînage métallique. Le chaînage, ça évite que le bâtiment euh, vrille sur lui-même ou, ou qui vacille comme ça. Ça, ça lui permet de, de, de se stabiliser au niveau des angles. Ça le rigidifie. It is also thanks to the chainage that the builders would be able to build these huge windows. The technique consists of making slots in a block of stone, then a hole to place an iron bar. Wedges are arranged at the four corners. The top component is fitted into the bar like a Lego piece. A clay seal is then laid, and in a specially made duct, molten lead is poured to seal it together. Unfortunately, on some complex parts, iron bars cannot be added. The builders came up with an ingenious system. The bar is inserted completely into the component, which can then be put into place without difficulty. Then simply slide the bar with the help of a rope to put it into the second piece. Here the bar is placed and the component supported. All that is left to do is to pour in the lead to seal the assembly. This method illustrates the incredible know-how of the Gothic builders. You have elements that are more and more fine, more and more elancés, and euh, to avoid that they fall or that they se tord, in the case of the pierre, that they se brise, the fer assures the stability of the whole. In 1275, the nave of the Cathedral of Strasbourg is finally completed. It took 40 years of work to achieve this architectural feat. And even if the building is still far from being finished, the builders are on the verge of succeeding in their gamble of creating a cathedral of light. Two years later, the architects are tackling the construction of the façade, an even more ambitious challenge. Là, on a un mastodon, enfin, je veux dire, elle s'impose. Hein. Vous partez depuis le parvis jusqu'à 142 mètres, comme ça, en levant, levant, levant les yeux vers l'infini. C'est ça qui est incroyable. The complexity of this facade is such that the builders will have to draw plans for the first time. Pour le 11e siècle, pour la cathédrale romane, on n'a pas encore des plans. Les plans d'architecture, les dessins d'architecture arrivent plutôt à l'époque gothique, euh, ce qui s'explique avec euh, l'architecture gothique qui devient de plus en plus compliquée. Euh, à partir de cette époque-là, on a vraiment besoin de dessiner, euh, tracer sur papier euh, ces projets. A stone's throw from the cathedral. A room with perfect temperature and humidity protects a priceless treasure. It is here, sheltered from the light, that the first architectural drawings of Strasbourg Cathedral are conserved. The oldest date back to the mid-13th century. C'est des chefs-d'œuvre qui sont presque uniques. Il n'y a pas beaucoup de dessins de ce genre aujourd'hui euh, au monde. This exceptional collection, composed of about 30 drawings, is one of the most important in Europe. These architectural plans are neither dated nor signed, but according to experts, this plan, called Drawing B, dates back to 1260. This extremely rare drawing is precious because it shows the project of the Gothic façade to come. En regardant ce dessin, on se croit vraiment sur le bureau de l'architecte du XIIIe siècle. Il est énorme, si vous regardez bien, il est déjà dessiné sur quatre parchemins qui sont cousus ou collés ensemble. Drawing B is almost three meters long and one meter wide. Despite its intimidating size, it shows only half of the cathedral's façade. For researchers, the reason is not technical, but economic. The 
le plan d'architecture de médiéval n'a rien à voir avec le dessin d'architecture d'aujourd'hui. D'abord, pour une question de coût, c'est une question de parchemin. Le parchemin coûte atrocement cher. Donc, en fait, si vous avez la façade de la cathédrale, vous allez dessiner que la moitié de la façade. As the façade is strictly symmetrical, half of the plan is sufficient to give the necessary indications to construct the entirety. This masterpiece had above all a technical use. Sur un même plan, sur une surface en 2D, on va avoir euh, l'élévation. Euh, l'élévation, donc c'est le dessin de la façade, hein, rabattu à plat, le plan. Le plan, c'est la vue de dessus. Euh, et certaines coupes, le profil, les détails. On va, sur des dessins d'architecture, donner toutes les informations sur un seul dessin. Ce qui fait que quand on regarde comme ça, on ne comprend strictement rien à ce qu'on voit. Drawings of such complexity that they will become difficult to decipher by the uninitiated. Aujourd'hui, on a du mal euh, à s'imaginer effectivement cette capacité d'abstraction par rapport au dessin 2D, à la conception. Il euh, n'y avait pas d'ordinateur, euh, pas de plan 3D, il euh, n'y avait rien de tout ça. À l'époque, on est en termes de création pure. C'est incroyable. The result is a unique architectural achievement. Three portals make up the base of the façade. Above them is a huge star-shaped rose window, considered to be one of the most beautiful of all Gothic cathedrals. Two towers are put on top. Started around 1277, it will take nearly a century to complete this titanic project. This incredible facade is now attributed to Erwin, known as von Steinbach. He is the first known architect of the Cathedral of Strasbourg. His plans are so sophisticated that they had to be explained to the craftsmen to complete the work. This was the role of an indispensable man, the parlier. Alors le rôle du parlier, c'est le second de l'architecte, c'est-à-dire il est le passeur, il est le souffleur des ordres ou des idées de l'architecte au tailleur de pierre. In the attic of the cathedral, the parlier will draw the most complex parts on the floor, such as the huge rose window. Le parlier va réaliser un dessin en vraie grandeur sur un sol, un sol de plâtre, une salle des traits qu'on appelle, une salle de dessin. Donc euh, il va tracer à l'aide de grands compas, de règles. Imaginez la rose, 13,60 m de diamètre, c'est une des plus grandes de France. Bien, cette rose a été dessinée à un moment ou un autre à l'échelle en vraie grandeur. All around this rose window, detailed decoration adorns the monumental facade, which culminates at 66 meters in height, the same height as a 20-story tower. In spite of its imposing size, the facade exudes a feeling of lightness. This lacework of stone is made of pink sandstone. Pourquoi le grès Parce que c'est la pierre qu'on trouve dans la région et qui permet euh, voilà, d'avoir une finesse quand même assez exceptionnelle. Pas comme le marbre, bien évidemment, euh, parce qu'il y a un grain qui est plus gros. Hein, c'est un petit peu comme du sable aggloméré. C'est un matériau ferme, pas dur, euh, abrasif, mais qui permet de, de, de réaliser des ouvrages très fins. This sedimentary rock, therefore, needs to be worked gently. C'est une pierre fragile, qui, qui se casse facilement. C'est une pierre quand même assez délicate, un peu comme du, parfois comme du verre. Il hein. faut y aller vraiment doucement. Et quand ça casse, le problème, c'est que ça ne prévient pas. Transforming stone into decor requires great dexterity. Thanks to the exceptional know-how of the stonemasons, the exterior of the cathedral is adorned with countless sculptures. La sculpture existe déjà à l'époque romane, de manière plus naïve, je dirais, mais il y en a moins. C'est plus, c'est plus discret, c'est présent mais plus discret. Mais après, à l'époque gothique, on va en ajouter vraiment un petit peu partout avec des gargouilles qui vont apparaître pour évacuer l'eau, etc. Beaucoup plus de chimères, d'êtres fantastiques. These characters illustrate the Bible, an effective way to teach the people of Strasbourg the great principles of the Christian religion. In analyzing these sculptures and certain elements of the façade, scientists have made an amazing discovery. Tous les murs intérieurs, toutes les parois, intérieur et extérieur, étaient peintes. 
Et surtout, tous les décors d'architecture, toutes les sculptures étaient peintes, mais alors avec du, du doré, du rouge, euh, du bleu, du jaune, du vert, tout ce que vous voulez. Chaque couleur avait une vocation et une, une interprétation. C'est comme une bande dessinée, on racontait une histoire, et c'est vrai que dès que c'est peint, en fait, c'est beaucoup plus expressif, on comprend beaucoup mieux les choses que quand on laisse la pierre naturellement dans sa teinte. Thanks to these colors, the sculptures on the facade strike the senses. En y ajoutant la peinture, on les rendait encore plus réels. Donc ça devait être encore plus impressionnant, voilà, avec le message qu'elle devait transmettre, de les voir en couleur, de voir un regard. So why did this paint disappear from the walls of Strasbourg Cathedral? For the experts, the answer lies in the evolution of the materials being used. Le matériau de construction à partir du XXe siècle, ça devient le béton. Donc, à partir du moment où la pierre n'était plus le, le matériau de construction euh, par excellence, on a voulu décaper toutes ces peintures qui se trouvaient sur les murs, parce que le, le matériau est devenu noble. Aujourd'hui, un constructeur euh, gothique reviendrait voir ce, les cathédrales, il serait effaré. C'est comme si nous, aujourd'hui, on, on allait voir une, une maison, un pavillon, toujours euh, sans enduit, ni pain, nu. Today, it is this famous pink sandstone that colors the monument, a type of rock that contains quartz, known to reflect light. The facade changes color depending on the time of day, and if the sculptures take on a particular dimension, they owe it to an innovation of the Middle Ages, the arrangement of the decoration located in front of the load-bearing walls. C'est le premier exemple qu'on connaisse d'une façade qui a des ornements posés en avant de la façade comme les espèces de cordes d'un instrument de musique, si vous voulez. Notre-Dame de Paris ou Reims, le décor est construit sur le mur, alors que Strasbourg, le décor est construit devant le mur. On a une succession de décors, en fait, qui lui donne toute cette légèreté. With this innovation, builders create a gigantic illusion, which is particularly effective. If you enleviez la couche des portails et de la harpe de pierre, vous aurez l'impression d'avoir juste un mur, un énorme mur de 70 mètres de haut. Et là, l'unique but de la harpe de pierre, c'est de donner une impression de verticalité. Et donc, pour donner cette impression de verticalité, il faut avoir cette, euh, ce décor presque aérien, presque intangible. Voilà. Et, et ça a été fait d'une façon mais, remarquable, c'est phénoménal. En termes de, de composition, de proportion, c'est magnifique. To fix the decoration of the facade in place, iron had to be used again in abundance. A system of bars embedded in the wall and connected to bands holds the assembly firmly in place. The facade was completed in 1371. The new building no longer has much in common with the original cathedral. The builders are on the verge of completion with their ambitious project. What remains is the last act of this construction site, the building of two spires. This is a huge challenge because the slightest miscalculation would reduce centuries of effort to nothing. La flèche de la cathédrale de Beauvais, elle s'effondre, hein. on va aller trop haut, trop vite et patatras. Donc euh, par expérience, par, euh, par empirisme, par calcul, voilà, ils vont assimiler des techniques, certaines ils vont les garder, les autres ils vont les mettre de côté, et petit à petit, donc, ils vont mettre en place une méthodologie toujours innovante, percutante, hein, toujours avec l'ambition, mais je pense toujours avec prudence. But in Strasbourg, everything will change. While the top floor of the North Tower is being built, the neighboring city of Freiburg is raising a 116-meter tall spire that surpasses the one planned by Strasbourg. The master builders were stung by this development and decided to increase their own architectural audacity. Il y a cette course à la hauteur euh, entre Bâle, Vienne, Ulm, Cologne, Strasbourg, toutes ces cathédrales pour avoir le, le, le bâtiment le plus haut. C'est comme un défi des bâtisseurs au Moyen Âge, parce qu'il faut imaginer qu'il y avait vraiment la course à la montre. Quelle ville a la plus haute tour Parce que ces édifices symbolisaient la puissance de la ville. 
First, in 1384, they added a belfry, probably to first solidify the base before installing two huge spires. Là, on redonne de la hauteur au massif occidental, on monte de la puissance, il y a une, une ambition de la bourgeoisie, là, on monte les muscles. Donc voilà, là, on finalise le beffroi, parce qu'on a déjà dans l'idée d'atteindre les sommets. To reach the sky, the city is looking for an architect capable of taking up this prodigious challenge. C'est Ulrich Denzingen, l'architecte, un méga star architecte de l'époque, qui euh, ne travaille pas uniquement à Strasbourg. Il va également travailler à Milan, à Bâle euh, et dans d'autres villes. C'est comme aujourd'hui, vous avez un, un méga star architecte qui travaille à Pékin, Shanghai, euh, Paris, New York en même temps. Ulrich Denzingen had a solid reputation when he arrived on the project in 1399. He imagined a 142 meter high spire, but at the time, the builders didn't have today's means to accomplish it. So how were they going to go about erecting this real medieval skyscraper? Pas de grue, euh, pas de moyen de levage euh, treuil électrique, euh, pas de chariot élévateur. Aujourd'hui, on, on appuie sur un interrupteur, on a de la lumière. Euh. Men will have to move blocks of stone weighing up to a ton with just their human strength. A sketchbook dating from the end of the 15th century tells us that there were many lifting machines on the Strasbourg Cathedral construction site. The most powerful of them was the hamster wheel. A specimen is preciously preserved at the top of the second tower of the cathedral. La machine de base, c'est le roue d'écureuil. C'est-à-dire qu'on met effectivement des ouvriers qui viennent, eux, euh, toute la journée, bah, c'est un travail assez pénible et plutôt bien payé d'ailleurs, euh, viennent euh, bah, faire comme un hamster dans, un, dans une roue d'écureuil, viennent actionner le treuil avec la force de leurs jambes et de leurs bras pour pouvoir monter les pierres. This hamster wheel-like machine is located at the very top of the second tower, 66 meters high. The machine works in the same way a crane would do today. However, the lifting power is provided by walking workers. The system allows blocks up to two tons to be lifted. Thanks to these surprisingly efficient construction machines, the work on the spire advances quickly. The first challenge for the architect is to build a spire in harmony with the tower. En gros, vous posez un cylindre sur un cube. Donc, esthétiquement parlant, et en termes de cohérence architecturale, c'est quand même un sacré challenge à, à relever. To reduce the aesthetic disparities, the architect designed an octagon to which he added four stair towers on the sides. The goal, to give the illusion that the base of the spire is square. The wager was successful. C'est ces quatre tourelles qui viennent euh, effectivement faire cette transition esthétique et qui donnent cette sensation d'élancement. Alors qu'en fait, vous n'en avez euh, fonctionnellement pas besoin de quatre tourelles d'escalier. Une seule suffit pour monter. This is the whole Gothic principle, using aesthetic devices to solve construction problems. On the building site, once the shape of the spire was decided, the builders tackle a second challenge, wind resistance. At these heights, wind can exert an exceptional force on anything that offers resistance. To alleviate this pressure, the miracle solution is again using iron. Once again, builders staple the larger blocks of stone and solidify the thinner elements by inserting lead-soldered metal bars inside. Finally, as with the façade, each component is carefully embedded and reinforced. You have des chaînages à hauteur régulière qui vont ceinturer. C'est un principe d'attel. Imaginez un tonneau. Vous avez des cerclages qui vont contenir les douelles. Et pour pour la flèche, voilà, elle est ceinturée de métal afin de, 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 de reprendre les charges et les pousser. Là, le fer, c'est essentiel hein, pour que ça tienne, hein, parce que là, on, vous avez quand même le vent qui, qui pousse et, et tout est cerclé, sinon ça, ça éclaterait euh, tout de suite. Quoi. This iron frame gives the construction an essential quality. 
It allows it to bend in the wind without ever breaking, like a reed. Là, vous avez un jeu de euh, de Lego en définitive bah, qui va tout simplement bouger, osciller légèrement, hop, et reprendre sa forme finale, ou même si on va dire il a un petit peu bougé de quelques millimètres. Voilà, il va se maintenir. With its semicircular shape, the Romanesque vault must have very thick pillars. It's impossible to build very high. By transforming the semicircle into a pointed arch, the Gothic rip vault allows for a new distribution of weight. The pillars can therefore be thinner and higher. Si une tour comme ça était fermée entièrement avec des vitrages ou avec de la pierre, euh, elle, aurait, elle subirait une telle sollicitation au vent qu'elle en serait lourdement fragilisée. Il faut imaginer qu'à ces hauteurs-là, le, 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 le vent a une emprise euh, énorme. Hein, donc euh, le, le fait qu'elle soit jouée, en définitive, bah, les vents dominants euh, traversent la flèche sans grande difficulté. The first part of the construction was completed in 1419, but as the base of the spire was just being finished, the architect died. The work then takes a new turning point. En fait, l'octogone avec les quatre escaliers a été réalisé par Ulrich Denzingen, qui meurt. Et donc finalement, c'est euh, le parlier, c'est-à-dire le second d'Ulrich Denzingen, s'appelle Jean Huls, qui est choisi et qui démarre deux ans plus tard la construction de la flèche qu'on connaît aujourd'hui, qui n'a rien à voir, mais rien à voir avec euh, le projet d'origine. The new architect Jean Hultz was under pressure by the city of Strasbourg and must absolutely reach the 142 meters of height planned by his predecessor. As with all cathedrals in France, a single spiral staircase had to be installed in the center in order to reach the top of the spire. But Jean Hultz is going to break with this established tradition. On n'a pas un escalier, on n'en a pas deux, on n'en a pas trois, on n'en a pas six, on n'en a pas sept, on en a huit. These eight staircases will make it possible to camouflage the eight edges which form the frame of the spire. Sur euh, ces huit arrêtiers qui sont porteurs, hein, qui sont de la structure, hein, et bien Jean Hout, au lieu d'en faire un élément inesthétique, va contourner le problème et son idée de génie, ça va être d'habiller ces arrêtiers. Et les habiller comment ben, en, en les coiffant tout simplement de huit escaliers. The concept of the cathedral spire has simply been reinvented in Strasbourg. Chef d'œuvre incroyable, ovni gothique. Voilà, faut pas peur. Moi, j'ai pas peur de le dire. C'est quasiment un ovni gothique. It is hard to imagine that the builders could have grasped the complexity of this architectural design based on a simple two-dimensional plan. Géométriquement, mais c'est incroyable. Géométriquement, c'est une folie. Même à reconstituer en 3D, euh, c'est très, très difficilement compréhensible. Donc à l'époque, il y avait certainement un, 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 un maquettiste. Il est certain qu'à un moment, il fallait un visuel 3D. Et, euh, et ce visuel, hein, comme on le ferait aujourd'hui avec une impression 3D, il était réalisé en bois. Euh, on le sait, alors pas, on ne peut pas l'établir. À Strasbourg, il y avait des maquettes, mais c'est intuitif, ça se ressent. On the construction site of Strasbourg Cathedral, this method would be implemented for the first time. The wooden models are made by a carpenter working in close collaboration with the architect. Two crests testify to this organization. Il nous reste deux écussons en haut de la flèche. C'est celui de Jean Hultz et c'est celui de Maître Ripel, charpentier, qui a dû faire la co-conception de la flèche pour arriver à régler tous les problèmes techniques qui étaient mais innombrables pour arriver à un tel chef-d'œuvre de finesse et d'architecture qui fait que ça a été déjà, dès, dès l'époque, considéré comme la huitième merveille du monde et qui a fait de l'œuvre Notre-Dame la loge suprême de l'Empire en termes de taille de pierre. Completed in 1439, it took the builders 40 years to wreck the entire spire. At its completion, it reaches over 142 meters high, the wager is won. It's a real feat. Cette grande flèche reste un défi euh, insensé euh, jusqu'à euh, la construction de la Tour Eiffel. 1439, fin de la flèche, une flèche médiévale comme ça, euh, au niveau euh, savoir technologique. Euh, 
chapeau bas, franchement euh, impressionnant. Et il faut réaliser à quel point ces constructeurs ont eu du culot euh, de réaliser un ouvrage pareil. J ai, j ai, j ai, je n'arrive même pas encore à, à imaginer comment on a pu oser quelque chose, euh, quelque chose comme ça. Once the building site finally finishes, the Cathedral of Strasbourg would retain its status as the highest monument in the Christian world for five centuries. Today, even if the structure has lost its crown, it remains in a category of its own. Cette silhouette unique devient quasiment un logo pour toute la région. Vous la dessinez en trois traits, vous reconnaissez euh, la cathédrale de Strasbourg. A mystery still hovers around this famous silhouette. According to the criteria of the Gothic style, the facade of the cathedral should be symmetrical. So why does it have only one tower? Il y avait une deuxième tour de prévu. On sait même qu'elle avait été commencée à un niveau extrêmement modeste. On avait sur la plateforme au-dessus de la tour sud, le départ d'une petit, petite tourelle d'escalier du même type de celle qu'il y a sur la tour nord. Wars, fires, lack of money, there are many reasons. For some researchers, the absence of this twin tower must be attributed to the exceptional duration of the construction of the cathedral, which spans nearly 400 years. 1439, on est à la fin du gothique. Le gothique n'est plus à la mode. En Italie, par exemple, on construit déjà en style Renaissance. C'est plus du tout à la mode, question du jour, de vouloir construire encore une haute tour. It is thus, perhaps, the arrival of the Renaissance in Strasbourg that stops the construction of the cathedral during the first half of the 15th century. But the scaffolding has never really disappeared since then, because this extraordinary monument requires constant restoration work. Chaque période a marqué la cathédrale par une restauration, des fois une extension, une reconstruction. Voilà, c'est une cathédrale euh, euh, voilà, qui a vécu. Unique of its kind, the Notre Dame Foundation has been watching over it for nearly eight centuries. Its goal, to bequeath the monument to future generations in the best possible condition. Si vous arrêtez de vous, de vous occuper d'un bâtiment euh, dans les 20 ou 30 ans, euh, si vous arrêtez l'entretien et la restauration, le bâtiment de lui-même va euh, tomber en ruine. Every time the specialists ask themselves the same question, should what has been damaged be replaced or should the original materials be preserved for as long as possible? La philosophie aujourd'hui, oui, c'est d'essayer de garder euh, le monument dans son état actuel le plus longtemps possible, donc de privilégier vraiment euh, la conservation. This philosophy allows the general public, as well as researchers, to admire a monument almost in its original state, a monument that reads like a history book on the revolution of Gothic architecture, the revolution of the builders of the Middle Ages, and their incredible know-how. On par with the Eiffel Tower, Paris's metro system is a true monument. At over a century old, it is the beating heart of the French capital. With 220 kilometers of track, 302 stations and 14 lines, it is indispensable to life in the city and carries more than 5 million passengers a day. That's 2 billion people each year. Continuously modernized and always at the forefront of technology, it nevertheless retains the appearance of its early days. It owes this uniqueness to Parisians who have held it dear since it was first created in 1900. Designed by visionary engineers such as Fulgence Bienvenu, the father of the metro, and realized in an era where everything was possible, this mega structure has marked the capital with its imposing viaducts which crisscross the Seine. But how did they achieve such feats? One of the aussi technology is the viaduct d'Austerlitz, with this portée exceptionnelle of 140 meters in one seule fois. The network has always benefited from the most innovative technologies. From the first wooden tunnels to chambers submerged in the Seine by freezing the ground, 
The construction, which began at the end of the 19th century, disemboweled Paris and boosted its performance. As for the 400 trains, today they look nothing like the original wooden wagons. They are increasingly faster, more secure, automated and interconnected. The network has succeeded in its technological gamble and brought its historic lines into the modern age. La ligne 1, c'est la ligne qui a le plus de voyageurs, puisqu'elle peut avoir jusqu'à 750 000 voyageurs par jour. Today, the network continues to grow, but the building techniques have changed. The Paris Metro uses the most innovative methods to continue its growth. These include giant tunnel boring machines capable of digging more than 30 meters deep. D'ici quelques années, on aura un train qui circulera toutes les 85 secondes à l'heure de pointe le matin, avec des systèmes entièrement automatiques. Line extensions will take the metro beyond the limits of the capital and connect with the new 200-kilometer-long Grand Paris Express network. How will the metro approach the future and its new urban issues? After more than a century of existence, the Paris metro has established its foothold in the 21st century. Discover the Paris metro like you have never seen it before. We are in Saint-Ouen, on the site of the Line 14 extension, a titanic construction costing nearly one and a half billion euros, situated in the heart of the city. Here, revolutionary techniques are used, making it almost invisible to the city's population. The project will add six kilometers and four stations to the existing line, linking the Saint-Lazare station and the Marie de Saint-Ouen station. 25 meters below ground level, the tunneling machine, Solène, is hard at work. It has covered 400 meters so far. Its aim is to create a new section towards Marie de Saint-Ouen station. Donc nous sommes ici dans le puits démarrage du tunnelier qui va creuser le tunnel de prolongement de la ligne 14 à près de 30 mètres de profondeur. Les métros modernes sont classiquement creusés avec des tunneliers, ce qui implique des profondeurs supérieures à ce qu'on pouvait faire au début du 20e siècle où on creusait sous les boulevards. L'avantage, c'est effectivement que les nuisances vont être beaucoup plus faibles pour les riverains. Les impacts en surface des travaux sont beaucoup plus faibles. Thanks to modern tunneling machines such as this one in Saint-Ouen, developed by a French company, the construction goes a lot faster, and the workers have given way to machines. Un tunnelier, c'est une machine qui va creuser un tunnel, mais pas seulement creuser le terrain, qui va aussi l'évacuer de manière euh, mécanisée. Et derrière, on va poser la paroi du tunnel final. Donc c'est une grosse usine qui avance euh, sous terre, un peu comme un verre de terre. The tunnel boring machine at 100 meters long and 9 meters wide is able to exert 7,000 tons of thrust against the wall it devours. Completely automated, the Solène can dig and construct the tunnel at the same time. At the front of the machine, the head, equipped with its numerous teeth, operates on the rock exactly like a drill bit. The cutting head eats away at the earth. The rubble is then rooted outwards with the help of an Archimedes screw, a giant feeder screw. The debris, saturated with water, is carried outside of the site on a conveyor belt. Stored in a reservoir, it is then taken away in lorries. At the same time that the earth is removed, the voussoirs, which will form the tunnel walls, are lowered into the starting well. They continuously supply the work of the boring machine. Dès qu'on a suffisamment creusé, on vient poser une tranche de tunnel. Une tranche de tunnel, c'est des pierres, un peu comme l'arche d'une cathédrale. Donc on vient former le tunnel. Dès qu'on a formé cette tranche de tunnel, eh ben on recommence à creuser. Following the advancement of the tunneling machine, a mechanical arm places the voussoirs one by one in a precise order. Assembled together, they will form the structure of the tunnel. The Romans used stone voussoirs to construct their arches. Like a giant puzzle, these prefabricated concrete parts weighing six and a half tons fit perfectly together to form watertight walls. On this extension of line 14, it will take seven to form a tunnel ring. C'est dans cette zone-là que la machine avance, donc que la partie qui est à ma gauche de la machine, là, avec la tête de coupe, va prendre appui sur le tunnel qui a été posé. 
par le biais de ces vérins, ils vont s'étendre suffisamment pour pouvoir venir poser un nouvel anneau de voussoir. No propulsion is required to move the machine forward. These hydraulic jacks allow the machine to lean against the voussoir that it installs and applies pressure which moves it forward. The tunnel boring machine at Saint-Ouen advances 200 meters a month towards its final target, situated more than five kilometers away. The speed must be adapted according to numerous parameters, including the type of earth and the diameter of the borehole, similar to a drill that you don't want to overpower for fear that it might jam. It's a mesh. If you start to dig 100, you start to lubricate the mesh when you dig in metal, you risk to abîmer your mesh directly, or to block it. That's the worst. In the beton, we see that. That is, you block your forest. At that moment, we're a bit like the machine. It's the same. It can be stopped because if we go too fast. We are far We are far from the days of the horse-drawn buses which filled the capital and the 1900 World Exposition which saw the birth of the Paris Metro. Today, it is made up of 220 kilometers of track, 14 metro lines, 303 stations and more than 400 trains which run seven days a week. The metro also has an unbelievable history which goes back nearly a century and a half. At the end of the 19th century, the transport in Paris is in a situation catastrophic. Il y a deux compagnies, la compagnie générale des omnibus et la compagnie des hirondelles. Les hirondelles, ce sont des petits bateaux à vapeur sur la Seine qui transportent environ 40 millions de personnes par an. Et la compagnie générale des omnibus tirée par des chevaux, il y a 200 000 chevaux dans Paris, et qui euh, fait environ 260 millions de transports par an. 260 million people, it's not enough, many more are needed because Paris very quickly absorbs its suburbs in 1860, the capital's population reached over 1,500,000 people. Paris is completely gridlocked. It needs an underground railway. London already has one, a steam railway underground. The competition is on. Il y a eu les projets les plus fantaisistes dès 1824, et puis il y a eu tous ces projets de chemin de fer à vapeur sur le sol, sous le sol, dans les immeubles, sur les immeubles. Et tout ça a été proposé à la ville de Paris, à l'État, au Parlement. Et euh, aucune décision ne se prenait parce qu'on ne maîtrisait pas vraiment l'idée qu'on avait de ce que serait un métro à Paris. Steam railway projects are discarded due to smoke emissions. The inventiveness of proposals for Parisian transport from visionaries and other passionate people is limitless. Airways hung by giant balloons, a suspended bridge between the two Eiffel Towers, an aerial tram passing over the city. Anything seems possible. The works of author Jules Verne seems to have inspired many of the projects, such as that conceived by a certain Monsieur Olivier, who in 1878 proposes an aerial tram passing over buildings in order to facilitate road crossings. This goes on for 40 years, with no results. The Parisians will have to be patient. In reality, there is a conflict between the state, who wants that the national metro be a prolongation of the network, and that the national network will traverse Paris, and the Department of the Seine, who wants a local metro, in any case, more centered on the city. From the outset, the design brief of the construction of the Paris Metro specifies that it will be, for the most part, subterranean, even if it will also have to cross the Seine by metal bridges. As for the trains, they will be electrically driven and must not exceed the size of 2.4 meters, which would inhibit the running of normal trains. La ville de Paris ne voulait pas créer un réseau de chemin de fer dans Paris qui permettrait de relier les grandes stations de train entre elles, ayant peur que la population prenne ces trains et, sans, et quitte la ville de Paris et qu'il n'y ait plus de population dans Paris. Cette idée à, à peu près, comment dire, euh, extravagante aujourd'hui était dominante à l'époque et donc elle empêchait qu'on réalise un métropolitain dans Paris. Mais en même temps, elle mesurait que c'était nécessaire. En 1896, l'État lâche Et effectivement, la ville de Paris va pouvoir se doter d'un métro local. Several important deadlines, such as the 1900 World Exposition, will ultimately put everyone in agreement. In Paris, an original means of transport is tested. It is called the road of the future. In fact, 
It is a rolling pavement over three kilometers long, which runs along the Seine, looping between the Champ de Mar and the Esplanade des Invalides. The Parisians go crazy for it. Elsewhere, an innovative subway project is born, and it is based on an invention that is changing society. En 1880, une révolution a lieu, c'est la révolution de l'électricité. Tout d'un coup, on se rend compte qu'on peut maîtriser des productions de transport par l'électricité et Jean-Baptiste Berlier invente un système remarquable. Il invente l'idée des tramways tubulaires souterrains électriques. Et il écrit un petit pamphlet et il est tellement sûr que c'est la bonne solution qu'il écrit dans son pamphlet « De toute façon, même si je mourrais, je suis sûr que c'est ça qu'on va réaliser. » Tramways have existed since the 1860s. First there were horse-drawn tramways, then steam and finally electric. The visionary, Berlier, imagines an underground tramway with a central rail which will provide the necessary electricity. Finally, in 1896, a Parisian engineer, Fulgence Bienvenu, is put at the head of the project. He is seen as the father of the metro, there is even a station with his name, Montparnasse Bienvenu. Il avait euh, en particulier œuvré euh, sur euh, à la fois euh, les réseaux d'égout et sur les réseaux d'approvisionnement en eau de la, de la ville. Et il y a une, une certaine analogie, je dirais, entre un tunnel de métro et un tunnel d'égout, ce qui a fait que euh, le, le personnage, en tous les cas, semblait tout à fait adapté à ce grand projet. Fulgence Bienvenu is the champion of the underground. But the Paris Metro is also made up of some spectacular constructions, incredible technological prowess for the time, and true artistic masterpieces. Plusieurs fois, le métro traverse la Seine. On a des viaducs remarquables comme le viaduc de Passy. Mais une des prouesses technologiques aussi, c'est le viaduc d'Austerlitz, avec cette portée exceptionnelle de 140 mètres en une seule fois. The construction of the Austerlitz viaduct was decided in 1903 to link the two banks of Line 5 between the stations Gare d'Austerlitz and the current station Quai de la Rapée. In order to avoid interfering with river traffic, the navigation service demanded that it should have no supports in the middle of the river. Situated 11.3 meters above the level of the Seine, the Austerlitz viaduct is made of steel. It consists of two large parabolic arches with three main joints, one at the top and two on either side near the riverbanks. The deck, which is 8.5 meters wide, is suspended from the arches by 16 supports in its center and four supports at its ends. To withstand wind force, the suspension supports are connected by crossed structures. To reinforce the structure, the arcs themselves are also connected together. The selected project, therefore, outlined a viaduct with a single span of 140 meters, beating the 107.5 meter long Alexandre III bridge, which was until that point the longest in Paris. On the banks, the viaduct arches rest on stone abutments, which are 22 meters long and 18 meters wide. Each of these blocks is surmounted on two 15 meter high masts, which frame the deck of the bridge. A work that is truly extraordinary for its time. In July 1906, the construction is finally completed. Line 5, which links Gare de l'Est to Gare d'Austerlitz, is in service. It is one of six lines which make up the initial project, but already a second stage of works is planned. For the designers, the metro must be for everyone and no person should be further than 400 meters from a station. It is for this reason that the first line to be constructed consists of 18 stations for only 11 kilometers of track. It is the transversal line from east to west, which departs from Porte de Vincennes to join Porte Mayotte. It runs along the Seine for nearly half of its length. 
The construction for Line 1 begins in February 1899. On va mettre en œuvre plusieurs techniques de, de construction du métro. Globalement, aujourd'hui, on, on estime à trois types de construction. On a une construction qui est plutôt du domaine de la mine, qui est la galerie boisée, où on va créer des galeries et les, les étayer avec du bois. This technique is used by all contractors in the construction of railway tunnels in particular. As in the mines, the digging is done by hand with a pick and shovel, grueling work that is carried out in extreme conditions. All the rubble is removed from the tunnels in wagons and transported to the surface. Some is used to refill Parisian quarries. As for the shafts, they are supported by enormous wooden beams, which also serve to create the shape of the future tunnel. Finally, still by hand, the vault is constructed from stone blocks, a work worthy of the construction of the pyramids. On a une deuxième technique, une technique qui sera employée plus tard, qui sera plutôt une technique de bouclier, qui sera peut-être aujourd'hui l'ancêtre du tonnelier, et qui consiste effectivement à creuser en poussant ce bouclier métallique et en construisant la voûte au fur et à mesure de l'avancement. In reality, the metal shield would not be used much on line one because it is very slow, difficult to put in place and stops as soon as it encounters a rock that is too hard. At the time, it was even sometimes necessary to dig by hand to move it forward in waterlogged terrain. These are the voussoirs placed one by one to create the tunnel ring. They are cast iron and positioned using a manual system. They give the tunnel its final shape. The shield concept truly is the ancestor of the modern tunnel boring machine, but this technique will take decades to be properly developed. It will take a century for a tunnel boring machine to be used again in Paris. Today, it is hard to imagine the busy Rue de Rivoli in this state, and yet it is the hell that Parisians will live with for 18 months. On a une dernière technique qui consiste en ouvrir la chaussée et à fermer la, la boîte de la station avec un tablier métallique. C'est des techniques qui sont très gênantes, il n'y a plus de circulation, et c'est des travaux qui concernent pratiquement un tiers de la ligne 1. This technique will be used near the Seine. Dug as shallow as possible to avoid leaks, the top of certain stations is sometimes only 60 centimeters from the wheels of the cars passing above. Une fois les projets d'infrastructure effectivement euh, livrés, il fallait euh, décorer, habiller les stations, il fallait aussi euh, l'arrivée du carreau biseauté blanc. On fait appel à Hector Guimard pour euh, les fameuses entrées euh, de stations de métro et le tout est livré à, à la compagnie de chemin de fer métropolitain de Paris qui va en assurer l'exploitation. The most advanced technologies were used in the electrification of the network. Two coal factories were built to provide enough energy for this new means of transport. This requires colossal investments which already combine public and private money. It is the CMP, owned by Baron Empin, one of the financial giants of the 19th century, who takes on this formidable gamble. The cost of investment is the following. The infrastructure made by the city of Paris is 600 million euros today. And the superstructure made by Baron Empin represents a little more than a million parce qu'il y a le coût des usines, les rames et euh, la décoration de toutes les stations de métro euh, et l'équipement euh, des chemins de fer. Les travaux de la ligne 1, c'est une chose qu'on ne saurait peut-être plus faire aujourd'hui. Ils ont été réalisés en, en moins de 18 mois. Il euh, y avait un, un impératif qui était de répondre à l'expo universel de 1900. Ceci dit, le métro est arrivé un petit peu en retard, il est arrivé trois mois en retard, il est, il est ouvert le 19 juillet 1900, alors que l'Expo Universelle a commencé en avril 1900. While the inauguration takes place quietly during the summer of 1900, those who took the crazy gamble on these tunnels which crisscross the capital have a new worry. Will the Parisians want to go down underground? In reality, it is a complete success, and at the end of 1900, it had reached close to 17 million passengers. An unimaginable result, since each train has only three wooden cars, which travel at a maximum of 21 kilometers an hour. 
This is far from the performance of the metro today, with its 400 trains at 90 metres long and increasingly automated system which carries 1,400 million passengers each year, more than 4 million a day. Donc là, on est à bord de la rame Westinghouse, donc la première rame, la rame de l'inauguration de 1900. Euh, avait, on a ce privilège d'être dans la rame première classe, avec ses sièges cuir, ses, ses bois précieux, des, des bois exotiques précieux, euh, et puis quelques petites particularités, comme ce qui se trouve au-dessus au de nos têtes, qui pourraient laisser penser à, à des portes bagages, mais en réalité qui sont des portes chapeaux parce que les, les hommes de l'époque portaient effectivement le chapeau et avaient à leur disposition ces dispositifs qui leur permettait de déposer leur coiffe pendant le voyage. Nearly 120 years later, things have well and truly changed, beginning with Line 1, the historic line which saw the evolution of the Paris Metro. It is increasingly connected, comfortable, automated and secure. The issue of security became evident when a fire in the 1930s triggered a long alert process within the maze of different RATP services. A delayed reaction, which is not very reassuring for the passengers. To answer growing concerns about the safety, the RATP implement centralized command posts, a revolution made necessary by the growing development of this megastructure. In 1967, Line 1 is one of the first to be equipped with a centralized command post. Fifty years later, it is the most modernized command post in the Parisian metro. With nearly 275 million people transported a year, the role of the Line 1 command post is paramount in order to respond to every situation as quickly as possible. Le PCC c'est le centre de la sécurité ferroviaire de la ligne, c'est-à-dire que dès qu'il y a une situation anormale que le système détecte, ça peut être un problème de porte par exemple avec un voyageur qui retient les portes, ça peut être une situation que le système détecte comme anormale, euh, il y a une alarme qui remonte ici qui est traitée par les superviseurs qui sont derrière moi et qui prennent en compte cette alarme et qui agissent en conséquence en fonction de la situation. In 2011, to better meet a growing demand, the traditional metro with a human driver is replaced by a completely automated line. The work was done at night without major interruptions to traffic. It was a world first. Les grands avantages de l'automatisation, c'est tout d'abord la sécurité, puisqu'on a un système qui empêche toute intrusion de voyageurs sur les voies, notamment. Le deuxième avantage de l'automatisation, c'est une grande souplesse d'exploitation, puisque on peut injecter des trains et ainsi augmenter l'offre de transport en fonction du besoin. Euh, le troisième euh, avantage de l'automatisation, c'est passer d'un intervalle de 105 secondes à un intervalle de 85 secondes, c'est-à-dire que sur une plage horaire définie, on peut injecter plus de trains et donc offrir un confort de voyage euh, supérieur à nos voyageurs et un nombre de voyageurs transportés supérieur. The Paris Metro is sometimes strained during large public demonstrations, for example, which stir the city. But the RATP is now able to quickly adapt its resources to meet demands at any moment, even on a Sunday. À la place d'une vingtaine de trains, on a mis en piste plus de 40 trains, en fait, ce qui nous a permis d'avoir un intervalle comme à l'heure de pointe, un dimanche après-midi. Since its creation, the evolution of the Paris Metro has been a real obstacle course. The construction of certain sections combines ingenuity, self-sacrifice and pure madness. This is the case of Opera Station. It is 1904, an entrepreneur undertakes a Herculean task. Here he will carry out the feat of burying a gigantic block of concrete in which three metro lines will cross over, one above the other, something that has never been seen before. Until now, Léon Chagnot has only dug a few tunnels on lines two and three. He owes his fame to the former, 
On it, he will test advanced techniques and become one of the more important builders of the Paris Metro. Thanks to this success, he will be entrusted with an even more unbelievable mission, the first crossing under the Seine River between the stations Châtelet and Cité. These two stations make up part of Line 4. Around 11 kilometers long, it leaves from Port de Clignacourt and runs all the way to Port Orléans. On devait pas passer sur ligne de la cité. On devait finalement rejoindre Châtelet Saint-Michel en passant euh, finalement à la pointe amont de, de l'île de la Cité, mais pour des raisons très simples, c'est que finalement ce métro devait passer juste sous l'académie juste sous l'académie française qui se trouve là là, et, et les académiciens n'étaient pas d'accord pour leur euh, leur calme, ils ont décidé de faire une pétition qui a été suivie par un certain nombre, de, à l'époque, de, de savants et, et, et autres. Et c'est là qu'on a décidé de dire non, on, on va passer par l'île de la Cité et on va faire une station île de la Cité. First of all, Chagnot builds the section that leads to the Seine. It goes from Châtelet station to the banks. It must now cross the long arm of the Seine to Cité station and then the small arm of the Seine to Saint-Michel station. They decide on chambers buried in the riverbed. The construction begins in 1905 and promises to be spectacular. There will be three large chambers for the larger branch of the Seine, covering a distance of 122 meters, and two for the smaller branch at 41 meters. The five chambers, which will be submerged in the river, will be assembled on the Quai de Tuileries, where the engineers will create their innovations. Each chamber is composed of a cast iron base housing the two future tracks. The whole structure is surrounded by a double-layered wall made from metal. The chamber rests on the base of the shape of a knife blade, 1.8 meters high. Between the two walls is an empty space, which will become a workspace where the builders will operate. The chamber which floats on the Seine is then towed to its future grounding place. After having found its ideal positioning, concrete is injected into the metal double wall, creating a watertight sarcophagus. As promised by the contractor, the construction site, despite its size, manages to avoid interference with the swallows and their passengers passing along the Seine. Under the weight of the concrete, the chamber falls gently. Once in place, the water in the interior of the work chamber is pumped. The main chamber is weighted down to keep it in place at the bottom of the river. Through chimneys, compressed air is sent into the work chamber, increasing its water tightness and allowing the builders to go down and dig under the metallic structure in order to sink it into the ground to the desired level. Working in extreme conditions, these specialized builders called tubists must, like underwater marine divers, make decompression stops when coming back up from the work chamber 15 meters below the surface. Strikes, which were rare at the time, will mark the history of this abnormal building site. Donc, Chagnon, d'habitude, n'avait jamais euh, ne négocié pas. Euh, si, si les ouvriers ne ne voulaient pas travailler, ils, ils en cherchaient d'autres. Mais là, c'était pas possible parce que c'était vraiment des spécialistes. Euh, peu pouvaient travailler comme ça sous sous air comprimé. Donc, euh, il va négocier avec eux parce que la première grève, la première grève dure un mois et demi. Et au bout d'un mois et demi, Léon Chagnot leur accepte deux choses finalement de meilleures conditions de travail, plus de sécurité et euh, bien sûr des primes au rendement. Meilleure sécurité, comment En fait, il, il va adapter aussi quelque chose qui n'avait jamais été fait à l'époque. Ça veut dire il va adapter un téléphone. Un téléphone en direct entre la chambre de travail et le haut. S'il y a un problème, tout de suite, on puisse euh, régler ce problème. Voilà. Thanks to the work of these capable men who took on this risky work, all the chambers of the same section were finally lowered to the right level on the bed of the Seine. They are then joined together to form a single tube. The work chambers are filled with concrete and the trench is filled to ensure that the structure is blocked in. The tunnel is complete. The water is then pumped and the workers can finally access it. This part, the most dangerous, will take place without any major problems, but the same cannot be said for the chamber under Ile de la Cité. On n'est pas sous la Seine, on est dans la terre, mais dans des terres un peu argileuses, marneuses, donc euh, ils sont pareils dans la chambre de travail en dessous, 
Euh, et il va y avoir un renard, ça veut dire qu'il va y avoir une fuite d'air comprimé. Et dès l'instant qu'il y a une fuite d'air comprimé, les, les, plusieurs ouvriers vont être éjectés de, 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 de la chambre de travail et les autres auront juste le temps de, de pouvoir boucher le trou pour pas que tout soit aspiré à l'extérieur. Et finalement, le chantier va être arrêté plusieurs jours. On va essayer de retrouver les ouvriers dans ces terres argileuses. On ne les retrouvera jamais. The pressure is so high in the chamber that they were ejected outwards like the passengers of an airliner whose door would suddenly open mid-flight. The stations, Cité and Saint-Michel, situated on the mainland, must also be buried. Once again, the sinking technique will be used and the builders will go down into the work chamber to pick away the waterlogged earth from below. A colossal job, especially when you see the images of these enormous steel hulls that gradually disappear into the ground. But the construction is not finished. A new difficulty stands before Lyon Chagnot. They have to pass beneath the railway line connecting Austerlitz and Orsay without it collapsing. Comme on touche la Seine, les terres sont marneuses, argileuses, donc il fallait trouver une solution pour, pour que ça tienne et qu'on puisse creuser tranquillement. Donc les solutions, c'était de boiser, mais ce n'était pas facile. Et donc il va décider de congeler le sol sur, finalement, les 80 mètres de ce passage très complexe. This freezing technique makes it possible to carry out dry work in water pockets and so enables the digging of more stable ground. For this, two refrigeration plants were built along the Seine. From there, pipes circulated salt water cooled to 24 degrees. The digging shaft passes beneath the railway line, which links Austerlitz and Orsay. So that the tunnel works did not endanger the tracks, the ground is frozen by inserting 24 refrigerated pipes, which went 14 meters deep. The volume of earth to be frozen is considerable, more than 2,000 cubic meters. This technique is so expensive and so complicated to develop that finally only 14 meters are treated. After 40 days, the ground is sufficiently frozen. The freezing works so well that the builders, who work with picks, have difficulty digging. The work is reaching the limits of what humans can achieve, and the construction can only take place at night when the trains do not run. In 1909, after four years of hard work, the gargantuan construction of the Seine crossing is complete. Up to 700 workers were employed at one time. The general inspector, Fulgence Bienvenue, comes to inspect it. His dream has become a reality. Two years later, elevators are installed, which give access down to Cité and Saint-Michel stations, situated far below the surface of the Seine. On the eve of the First World War, nearly 40% of the network was already built, making up 90 kilometers of the 220 kilometers that exist today. In 1939, 160 kilometers are in service. At this time, the metro already carries 500,000 passengers. Over the following years, 60 kilometers will be added to the lines to complete the network. In the 30s, we are on the second evolution of the metropolitan network. On arrive effectivement à un moment où on va commencer à réfléchir au prolongement des lignes en banlieue. Et entre 1929 et 1935, on va réaliser 43 stations. Some of them make it possible to travel to the limits of Paris. The 1931 colonial exposition takes place in Vincennes. Port de Ré station, inaugurated for the occasion, will bring millions of visitors eager to discover the beauties of the French Empire. All the continents are represented there in their most beautiful finery. In a glorified image attracting the crowds, with more than 30 million admissions, this event is a huge success. The Metro demonstrates once more its unparalleled capacity to transport the masses. As intended by its designers, it became indispensable to the Parisian population. Après, on arrive effectivement à une période un, un peu plus tumultueuse, qui est euh, la Seconde Guerre mondiale, où plus grand chose va, va se passer. Le réseau de métropolitain va même être réduit en termes d'exploitation, puisque il n'y aura plus qu'en gros 90 km du réseau qui seront exploités pendant la guerre. La reprise, 
l'après-guerre va être un, un vrai engouement pour le métro, mais le métro est vieillissant et on va commencer à réfléchir euh, effectivement à l'évolution de ces infrastructures. On oublie en fait euh, les prolongements de lignes, on travaille sur le métro existant. Today, the 14 existing lines are subject to wear and tear and various incidents. This enormous structure is therefore constantly monitored and everything possible is done to keep the lines running. Some, built at the very beginning of the 20th century, are totally renovated, respecting the spirit of their unique heritage. This is the case particularly of the aerial lines, whose metal structures have for decades met the expectations of the engineers who designed them. This is why the metro, now indispensable to Parisian life, never completely sleeps. Each night, 2,000 agents work to maintain the tracks, which zigzag through the bowels of the city. The RATP workers must work fast, as they have to leave their work sites before 5 o'clock in the morning. Technicians today still use techniques developed by generations past. To assemble the rails to be replaced, they are welded together with the help of a sort of small portable foundry. This is a technique used even in the 1930s. The hundreds of metro trains travel tens of thousands of kilometers each year, requiring colossal maintenance. Each line has its own maintenance workshop. We are in Bobigny. All the Line 5 trains come here to undergo maintenance, tests and repairs at least five times a year. Ici, nous réalisons des activités préventives et correctives, des entretiens techniques, à l'instar de ce qu'on fait sur les voitures au changement des plaquettes. Là, c'est la même chose, on va changer aussi les organes de frein, toutes les pièces d'usure, mais aussi des activités plus lourdes, comme le tour en fosse où on va reprofiler des roues. Like with car tires, which wear out and become misshapen, the metal wheels of the metro trains require a reprofiling every 200,000 kilometers, or three years of use. It is a way of improving the comfort of the passengers and also ensuring optimal safety by gaining adhesion. Here the cars are checked from every angle. One of the main advantages of this state-of-the-art workshop is the possibility of working on the bogies, which include the engine, the undercarriage and the axles, and which weigh more than seven tons. Huge hydraulic cylinders separate the wagons from the bogies. An exceptional system, which allows them to be repaired or changed. It is a long way away from the manual workshops 50 years ago, where adjustments took forever. Technology has revolutionized the RTP maintenance workshops. But today, like yesterday, nothing is left to chance here. On réalise actuellement une opération de nettoyage sous caisse. Cette activité est réalisée tous les 60 000 km. Ça représente à peu près 9 mois de circulation. An operation that is required to facilitate the technician's diagnostic who check each part and also to avoid any possible accidents where the oil might risk setting on fire due to the heat. There have been few fires, sometimes with unexpected causes, since the metro opened. The most tragic took place just after a few years of use, on the 10th of August in 1903. An incendie se déclare à la, à la station Couronne et provoque euh, le décès de 84 personnes. En réalité, c'est pas euh, la voiture qui contient euh, les voyageurs euh, qui s'enflamme. C'est un incident technique et une, un court-circuit électrique qui arrive dans un train précédent qui est parti dans le tunnel et qui, par le dégagement de fumée, euh, va provoquer la mort de 84 personnes dans la station Couronne. The grief is immense. The young metro has just claimed its first victims. Its operators will learn many lessons. On a fait évoluer le matériel. On est venu isoler dans une cage métallique, en quelque sorte, toute la logique de motorisation et toute la logique d'électrification. Et on, est, on a créé aussi euh, cette logique de bogie moteur, ce qui permettait effectivement d'isoler toute la partie euh, bois que vous voyez, la partie bois euh, qui est euh, plutôt l'espace voyageur, de l'isoler et de limiter tous les risques d'incendie. Cette euh, évolution était une évolution provisoire puisqu'on est passé euh, ensuite euh, 
euh, très rapidement à une évolution d'un nouveau type de matériel qui est un matériel en caisse totalement métallique et qui, euh, effectivement, là, pour le coup, limitait tous les risques d'incendie. The trains of today are therefore the result of a series of evolutions that go back to the very first wooden cars. But the real revolution begins after the Second World War. 1949, c'est la création de la RATP. On va commencer avec les ingénieurs de la RATP à réfléchir à ce que sera le futur métro de demain. Et travailler sur le métro de demain, c'est l'invention du métro à pneus en 1951. Euh, le métro sur pneu va donner naissance à toute la génération des métros sur pneu à Paris, mais aussi dans le monde, euh, puisque c'est la, la première réalisation. The Paris Metro will not evolve much over the years to come. The glorious 30s is the age of the automobile. It is not until the 1970s that new changes will be seen. The passengers discover the first automatic ticket machines and the first turnstiles to which they would have to become accustomed. In 1973, the last ticket stamper retires. The RTP creates the Carte Orange Metro Pass in 1975. It will change the lives of thousands of Parisians. More than ever, the Metro and its passageways are living quarters appropriated by the population. In terms of infrastructure, the Parisians see the creation of several line extensions as well as a new regional transport network composed of five lines at 587 kilometers long, the RER. 20 ans après, euh, on repart effectivement dans l'avancée technologique. On crée la première ligne automatique sur le réseau parisien avec la création de la ligne 14 euh, qui va aussi euh, désaturer en particulier la ligne A du RER. Et ensuite, on va... Euh, faire évoluer le réseau d'aujourd'hui avec l'idée de l'automatisation. Line 14, Meteor, is the start of a double revolution as it is the first metro without a driver and also with stations equipped with electronic doors which open simultaneously with the train doors. Le métro de l'an 2000, lui, s'appelle Meteor. Métro Est-Ouest rapide. Il renouvelle totalement la conception du transport urbain dans des stations de 120 mètres de long, à l'architecture claire et accueillante. Constructing this line, which crosses Paris from east to west, from the 9th to the 13th arrondissements, is a new challenge because it must pass beneath the belly of the city, its car parks, its underground networks, its buildings, and even the Seine. For this, it will use a revolutionary technology, the tunnel boring machine a gigantic construction site which will last five years and require double the amount of steel than was used for the Eiffel Tower. Line 14 is the seventh line to cross the Seine between the stations Cours saint emilion and Bibliothèque François Mitterrand. Ninety years after the first operation to pass under the Seine, chambers will once again be used in this crossing but this time no one's life is at risk. Gone are the days where men work under the huge metal structures. Excavators with giant arms are used to make a huge trench, 14 meters wide, in the riverbed. The four chambers are 34 meters long, 6 meters high and 9 meters wide and made of prefabricated concrete. They are constructed directly on site. Submerged slowly and under heavy surveillance, they are then directed towards their grounding site. Positioned in line with the trench, the chambers disappear into the Seine, reaching their final placement. They are then covered with earth. Joined together, they form a new passage under the Seine. Nearly 20 years later, line 14 opens. New extension works begin. Le prolongement de la ligne 14 a été conçu par rapport à un objectif principal qui est la désaturation de la ligne 13. Euh, il est d'ailleurs en correspondance avec chacune des deux branches de la ligne 13 puisque la ligne 13 forme un Y euh, au nord, respectivement à Porte de Clichy et Mairie de Saint-Ouen de façon à ce que les deux branches de la ligne 13 puissent profiter de cet effet de désaturation. On estime que euh, la fréquentation de la ligne 13 va baisser de l'ordre de 20 à 30% à la, mise à, à la mise en service du prolongement de la ligne 14. 
but to achieve this goal, the contractors will have to overcome new obstacles, starting with avoiding existing metro lines. They will have to dig very deep using the tunneling machine, which will descend 30 meters below ground level. At these depths, new challenges await the engineers. The ground to be dug is relatively loose and does not pose a particular difficulty. However, the route is situated beneath the level of the water table. The contractors will have to combine technology and ingenuity. Concrètement, euh, le tunnel est sous le niveau de la nappe. Si on n'avait pas les murs en béton autour de nous, il y aurait ici une grande piscine qui viendrait euh, au-dessus du niveau de la tête. C'est-à-dire que le gros enjeu, c'est d'assurer euh, en permanence pendant la réalisation des travaux l'étanchéité, empêcher l'eau de venir euh, perturber le fonctionnement du chantier et assurer également une pression suffisante pour maintenir en place tous ces terrains euh, de façon à éviter tout risque de tassement en surface. Digging with a tunneling machine has a number of advantages for the use of the future line. On a aussi des tracés beaucoup plus rectilignes, on n'est pas gêné par euh, les bâtiments, les fondations, ce qui donne une vitesse commerciale plus importante et un voyage beaucoup plus rapide pour les riverains. En sens inverse, les stations sont un petit peu plus profondes et donc on a un petit peu plus de temps d'accès au quai que ce qu'on pouvait faire au début du XXe siècle. These works can be carried out without disrupting traffic circulation, a true feat. Dans ce tunnel, euh, d'ici quelques années, on aura un train qui circulera toutes les 85 secondes à l'heure de pointe le matin avec des systèmes entièrement automatiques. Donc aujourd'hui, on a posé les anneaux en béton du tunnel. Demain, il va falloir remplir le fond de ce tunnel de béton, venir dessus, poser la voie sur laquelle va rouler le train et enfin déployer l'ensemble des systèmes qui garantissent la sécurité du voyageur, le fonctionnement automatique des trains, la capacité à échanger entre le PCC et le train euh, au fur et à mesure de l'avancée du train pour pouvoir dialoguer avec les voyageurs, bref, l'ensemble de l'intelligence du système automatique. The Line 14 extension will open in 2019. After this, it will see other additions, such as an extra station in the north, in Saint-Denis-Pleyel, and an extension of around 15 kilometers in the south, joining Orly Airport. These two new stations will be connected to the whole Grand Paris Express network. This is the big idea of the Grand Paris network, to multiply the connections within the existing network. This will be the case for 75% of the new stations. Quite an accomplishment when you consider the importance of the construction which is beginning. The Grand Paris Express is a new transport network. At 200 kilometers long, it is as long as the current Paris Metro. The four new lines are completely automated, traveling up to 120 kilometers an hour between 68 new stations a circular network which joins France's main regions and aims to decongest the existing network. It was time. The Paris metro megastructure began to seize up. Another way had to be found. Avec le, le, le réseau Grand Paris, on pourra passer de banlieue à banlieue sans euh, passer par le centre de Paris. Ça va permettre de décharger les transports du quotidien et notamment la ligne A, la ligne B. Donc très concrètement, euh, aujourd'hui, euh, quelqu'un qui part de la Défense et qui veut aller à Roissy, Aujourd'hui, il met une heure, euh, demain, euh, il mettra 35 minutes, et donc euh, il va gagner concrètement 25 minutes. A circular network for skirting around Paris and saving time. For the Line 15 South, which will link the west and the east of Paris without passing through the capital, 13 architects have designed 16 new stations. They no longer seek to hide them. They are thought to be true living spaces, making their mark on the heart of the city. Le métro du Grand Paris, euh, c'est bien sûr euh, que c'est un projet de transport qui sera innovant, mais c'est surtout le support, le socle d'un projet urbain et, et, et de création de services et de création de quartiers. Euh, voilà, donc toute, la, toute la réflexion est, est naturellement menée en ce sens et pas à l'échelle d'une gare, mais vraiment à l'échelle du réseau tout entier. The first works have begun, and Line 15, which will surround Paris, will be completely finished in 2027. But this is not it, as numerous extension projects on existing lines have already been planned. The network must respond to the growing Parisian urban area, but also to its usage, which increases by 3% each year, to soon reach a billion and a half passengers transported. Le métro, pour moi, c'est l'éternelle modernité. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut se réinventer en permanence. La ville, elle évolue, 
le métro, il doit évoluer, il doit suivre la ville. C'est le réseau sanguin, entre guillemets, de la, de la, de la ville. Euh, à la fois, on a un métro patrimonial qu'on entretient, qui est, un, euh, qui est un métro historique pour lequel il y a une, il y a une, une relation affective et, avec ce métro. Et puis, il y a aussi cet enjeu technologique permanent de remise en cause. Et cet enjeu... Euh, euh, vers l'automatisme, vers euh, le métro sans conducteur. Les deux doivent vivre ensemble, c'est-à-dire qu'on doit faire vivre à la, fois, à la fois du métro historique et un métro moderne. Soon, this formidable structure, conceived by its creators as a self-contained system, will be connected with the main Paris Express line, but also to the RER lines, forming a network over 1,000 kilometers long. The Paris Metro, a giant megastructure, born more than a century ago, and which relies on its history to write its future. know-how.